Welcome. I would first like to remind everyone to please mute your line when you're not speaking. Slide two, please. For media and press, the FDA press contact is Jeremy Kahn. His email is currently displayed. Slide three, please. My name is Maria Coyle, and I will be chairing this meeting. I will now call day two of the May 9th to 10th, 2023, joint meeting of the Non-Prescription Drugs Advisory Committee and the Obstetrics, Reproductive, and Urologic Drugs Advisory Committee to order. Dr. Moon Hee Choi is the designated federal officer for this meeting and will begin with introductions. Good morning, uh, my name is Moon Hee Choi and I will be, um, I am the designated uh, federal officer for this meeting. When I call your name, please introduce yourself by stating your name and affiliation. Dr. Barron. Good morning, Elma Barron from Cleveland, Ohio. I'm professor at Case Western Reserve University and service chief in dermatology at the VA of Northeast Ohio. Dr. Coyle. Uh, good morning, Maria Coyle, uh, Associate Professor of Pharmacy at The Ohio State University College of Pharmacy and the Wexner Medical Center. Dr. Pisarek. Paul Pisarek, Family Medicine in Arch at, working at Archwell Health in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Dr. Roth. Dr. Roth, you are on mute. Good morning. Uh, this is Catal I'm Catalin Roth. I'm a professor of medicine at George Washington University, specializing in uh, general internal medicine, geriatrics, and palliative care. Thank you. Dr. Walker Harding. Hello, I'm Leslie Walker Harding, uh, Chair of the Department of Pediatrics, University of Washington, and Chief Academic Officer at Seattle Children's, and I'm an adolescent medicine doctor by specialty. Dr. Dado? Mark Dado, I'm the industry rep for the Non-Prescription Drug Advisory Committee and uh, pediatric pulmonologist by training retired. Dr. Gass? Dr. Gass? Dr. Gass, you might be on mute. We can go back to Dr. Gass. Um, Dr. Shaw? Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Pamela Shaw. I'm Senior Investigator of Biostatistics at the Kaiser Permanente Washington Health Research Institute. Dr. Fox? Dr. Fox, you may also be on mute. Hi, uh, Michelle Fox. I'm an OBGYN and the um, industry representative for the Obstetrics, Reproductive, and Urologic uh, Drug Committee. Dr. Armstrong. Hi, I'm Deb Armstrong. I'm a medical oncologist at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, I specialize in breast and gynecologic cancers and cancer genetics. I'm a professor of oncology and of gynecology and obstetrics, and I'm a prior member and chair of the Oncology Drugs Advisory Committee for FDA. Dr. Bauer. Hi, I'm Cynthia Bauer. I'm director of the Horowitz Center for Health Literacy at the University of Maryland School of Public Health. Dr. Berenson. Hi, I'm Dr. Abby Berenson. I'm a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Texas, where I direct the Center for Interdisciplinary Research in Women's Health. Good morning. 
Dr. Berlin. Hi, good morning. I'm Dr. Elise Berlin. I'm an adolescent medicine physician. I am professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the Ohio State University College of Medicine and a faculty physician at Nationwide Children's Hospital. Thank you. Um, can we go back to Dr. Gass? Dr. Gass? Hello, I'm an obstetrician gynecologist, retired professor emeritus from the University of Cincinnati. Thank you. Dr. Catlin? Good morning, everyone. I'm Jesse Catlin, professor of marketing at California State University, Sacramento, and my uh, expertise is in the area of consumer behavior. Dr. Curtis? Good morning. I'm Kate Curtis. I'm an epidemiologist in the Division of Reproductive Health at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Eske? Good morning. I'm Eve Espy. I'm a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the University of New Mexico and chair of the department uh, and specialize in complex family planning. Ms. Everhart. Good morning. I'm your patient representative. My name is Sabrina Everhart. I'm out of Charlestown, Indiana. Thank you. Dr. Hahn. Good morning. My name is Dr. Jolie Hahn. I'm a supervisory research health scientist at the James A. Haley Veterans Hospital and Research Service in Tampa, Florida. I am also an adjunct associate professor in the Division of Epidemiology in the Department of Internal Medicine at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, Utah. Thank you. Ms. Rabadi. Hi, Suzanne Rabadi. I am the founder of Medchetta Foundation and the executive director of the ES Action. I'm the consumer rep. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, FDA. Um, Dr. Stein. Dr. Stein, director of the Office of New Drugs, Cedar FDA. Dr. Murray. Karen Murray, Deputy Director, Office of Non-Prescription Drugs, FDA. Thank you. Um, Dr. Horn. Pamela Horn, Director, DNPD2, Office of New Drugs. Dr. Nguyen. Good morning, Christine Nguyen, Deputy Director, Office of Rare Diseases, Pediatrics, Urologic, and Reproductive Medicine. Dr. Gassman. Audrey Gassman, Deputy Director, Division of Urology, Obstetrics, and Gynecology at the FDA. Ms. Cohen. Good morning, Barbara Cohen, Social Science Analyst, DNDP2, FDA. Dr. Jacob. Good morning, Gina Jacob, Medical Officer, Division of Non-Prescription Drugs Two, FDA. Dr. Kotak. Good morning, Anandi Kotak, Medical Officer, Division of Urology, Obstetrics and Gynecology, FDA. Thank you. For topics such as those being discussed at this meeting, there are often a variety of opinions, some of which are quite strongly held. Our goal is that this meeting will be a fair and open forum for discussion of these issues and that individuals can express their views without interruption. Thus, as a gentle reminder, individuals will be allowed to speak into the record only if recognized by the chairperson. We look forward to a productive meeting. In the spirit of the Federal Advisory Committee Act and the Government in the Sunshine Act, we ask that the advisory committee members take care that their conversations about the topic at hand take place in the open forum of the meeting. We are aware that members of the media are anxious to speak with FDA about these proceedings. However, FDA will refrain from discussing the details of this meeting with the media until its conclusion. Also, the committee is reminded to please refrain from discussing the meeting topics during breaks or lunch. Thank you. Dr. Mooney Choi will read the conflict of interest statement for the meeting. 
The Food and Drug Administration is convening today's joint meeting of the Non-Prescription Drugs Advisory Committee and the Obstetrics, Reproductive, and Neurologic Drugs Advisory Committee. With the exception of the industry representatives, all members and temporary voting members of the committees are special government employees or regular federal employees from other agencies and are subject to federal conflict of interest laws and regulations. The following information on the status of this committee's compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws covered by but not limited to those found at 18 U.S.C. Section 208 is being provided to participants to today's meeting and to the public. FDA has determined that members and temporary voting members of these committees are in compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws. Under 18 U.S.C. Section 208, Congress has authorized FDA to grant waivers to special government employees and regular federal employees who have potential financial conflicts when it's determined that the agency's need for a special government employee's services outweighs his or her potential financial conflict of interest, or when the interest of a regular federal employee is not so substantial as to be like, deemed likely to affect integrity of the services which the government may expect from the employee. Related to the discussions of today's meeting, members and temporary voting members of these committees have been screened for potential financial conflicts of interest of their own, as well as those imputed to them, including those of their spouses or minor children, and for purposes of 18 U.S.C. Section 208, their employers. These interests may include investments, consulting, expert witness testimony, contracts, grants, creatives, speaking, teaching, speaking, writing, patents and royalties, and primary employment. Today's agenda involves discussion of Supplemental New Drug Application, SNDA 017031S041, Ropil, Neurogestural Tablet 0.075 milligram, Submitted, submitted by Laboratoire HRA Pharma. Opil is proposed for non-prescription use as a once daily oral contraceptive to prevent pregnancy. This is a particular matters meeting dur during which specific matters related to Laboratoire HRA Pharma's SNDA will be discussed. Based on the agenda for today's meeting and all financial interests reported by committee members and temporary voting members, no conflict of interest waivers have been issued in connection with this meeting. To ensure transparency, we encourage all standing committee members and temporary voting members to disclose any public statements that they have made concerning the product at issue. With respect to FDA's invited industry representatives, we would like to disclose that Dr. Mark Dato and Dr. Michelle Fox are participating in this meeting as non-voting industry representatives acting on behalf of regulated industry. Dr. Dato's and Dr. Fox's role at this meeting is to represent industry in general and not any company. Dr. Dato is retired and Dr. Fox is employed by Merck Research Laboratories. We would like to remind members and temporary voting members that if the discussions involve any other products or firms not already in the agenda for which an FDA participant has a personal imputed financial interest, the participants need to exclude themselves from such involvement and their exclusion will be noted for the record. FDA encourages all other participants to advise the committees of any financial relationships that they may have with the firm at issue. Thank you. Before we proceed with today's agenda, during the open public hearing session from day one, speakers number 33 slides did not appear. And thus we will go back to um, open public hearing speaker number 33 so that they are able to speak with their slides. I will reread the statement from yesterday. Both the FDA and the public believe in a transparent process for information gathering and decision-making. To ensure such transparency at the open public hearing session of the advisory committee meeting, FDA believes that it is important to understand the context of an individual's presentation. For this reason, FDA encourages you, the open public hearing speaker, at the beginning of your written or oral statement to advise the committee of any financial relationship that you may have with the applicant, its product, and if known, its direct competitors. For example, this financial information may include the applicant's payment of your travel, lodging, or other expenses in connection with your participation in this meeting. Likewise, FDA encourages you at the beginning of your statement to advise the committee if you do not have any such financial relationships. If you choose not to address this issue of financial relationships at the beginning of your statement, it will not preclude you from speaking. The FDA and this committee place great importance in the open public hearing process. The insights and comments provided can help the agency and this committee in their consideration of the issues before them. That said, in many instances and for many topics, there will be a variety of opinions. One of our goals for today 
is for this open public hearing to be conducted in a fair and open way where every participant is listened to carefully and treated with dignity, courtesy, and respect. Therefore, please speak only when recognized by the chairperson. Thank you for your cooperation. Speaker number 33, please unmute and turn on your webcam. You may begin and introduce yourself by stating your name and any organization that you are representing for the record. Good morning and happy to be with you again today. My name is Dr. Sherry Priyadar and I'm a board certified adolescent medicine physician here today representing the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine or SAM. SAM is a nonprofit multidisciplinary professional society of 1200 members committed to the promotion of health, well-being and equity for all adolescents and young adults. I have no relevant financial disclosures. Yesterday, you heard from several prominent clinicians representing themselves and various medical societies and heard the powerful voices of young adults sharing their experiences and advocating for access to evidence-based reproductive health care. This morning, I would like to echo the voices you heard yesterday and talk with you about Valerie, the 16-year-old patient that I never saw. She lived over an hour away and was told our clinic was the closest that provides birth control to adolescents. Valerie couldn't get to her appointment, as is the case with many teens. Change slide, please. Sam endorses making OPIL available over the counter with no age restriction. Change slide, please. Let me share with you how this could positively impact our adolescent patients, such as Valerie. Oral contraceptive pills, abbreviated as OCPs, are available without prescription in more than 100 countries and have already been used safely by millions of people around the world. OCPs are also the most common contraceptive used by my patients, adolescents. Adolescents have unique barriers to contraceptive access, including those related to transportation, appointment availability, and cost associated with healthcare visits. Like Valerie, in a recent national survey, the overwhelming majority of respondents reported facing at least one barrier to obtaining contraception as a teen or young adult. And because of this, were unable to obtain that prescription. Minoritized adolescents have even more barriers to accessing care. These groups include Black, Indigenous, and people of color, recent immigrants, LGBTQ youth, youth with disabilities, and those in more rural neighborhoods. An over-the-counter contraceptive would reduce inequities for these young people. Change slide, please. This pill is more effective at preventing pregnancy than other over-the-counter options currently available. Furthermore, per the CDC, for healthy women, no exam nor tests are needed before starting progestin-only pills, and mandating such only reduces access to care as it has for our patient, Valerie. This medication is safe, making over-the-counter status the appropriate way to make it available to the public. In fact, absolute contraindications for progestin-only pills are exceedingly rare in adolescents. Early studies show that many adolescents can understand the drug facts label for this oral contraceptive and that adolescents can self-select for use. Next slide, please. Today, as members of the FDA Advisory Committee, you can make a public health impact in increasing access to this safe contraceptive. And on behalf of Sam and Valerie, I urge you to make this pill available with no age restriction. Next slide, please. Thank you for the opportunity to testify again today. Thank you. Um, before we move on to the charge for the committee, uh, I would like um, to call on Dr. Karen Murray. Uh, this is a representative of the sponsor and they have asked FDA to address uh, a question, Dr. Murray. Karen Murray. 
Deputy Director, Office of Non-Prescription Drugs, FDA. I wish to clarify something that appears to have caused a misunderstanding. We heard after yesterday's meeting that some people interpreted an FDA statement as saying that FDA did not review the applicant's protocol for access. That is not correct. We did review the extensive protocol document in detail. However, with respect to the applicant's unusual way of counting selectors, that was not flagged, was not in keeping with FDA guidance, and we did not agree to it. We have gone back to the actual protocol, and the applicant's brief mention of this approach is confusingly worded and open to interpretation. However, we did want to make it clear the FDA did review the protocol in detail. Dr. Murray, thank you. We will now move on to take some additional clarifying questions from day one. We will start with the remaining clarifying questions from panel members that did not get a chance to ask their clarifying question to HRA Pharma. And then at the conclusion, we will go back to the panel panelists that did not get a chance to ask their clarifying questions for FDA. Um, please use the raise hand icon to, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Hahn. Uh, just as a reminder, Dr. Hahn, to please state your name for the record before you speak and to direct your question to a specific presenter if you can. If you wish for a specific slide to be displayed, please let us know the slide number if possible. And as a gentle reminder, please acknowledge the end of your question with the thank you and any follow-up question with that is all for my question so that we can move on to the next panel member. Dr. Hahn. Good morning, my name is Dr. Hahn. I have three questions. My first question is uh, for the um, access trial representative. Uh, during the consenting process, were the participants informed of the intention to make this medication over the counter as a part of this trial? Yes, uh, they were informed actually from the beginning, including all the recruitment materials made it clear. Thank you very much. And could you speak, uh, state your name for the record, please, HRA? Yes, Irene LaRora, HRA Pharma. For my second question, this is for um, the representative that would be supporting the label development. I noticed on the label that it says take one time a day, or if you'd like to show the label, um, you're welcome to put that up on the screen so that I can be clear in the language. Yes. So it says, take one tablet at the same time every day. May I ask, did you consider the terminology take by mouth at this, take one tablet by mouth at the same time every day? Was this considered for the label? And was there a reason that you did not include the term by mouth? Um, I don't recall that we uh, at, uh, considered that exact wording. But of course, we're open to discussion on topics uh, about how to convey the information on the label. I do recommend that you consider this terminology for the directions, as there have been cases where individuals have been instructed to take a medication um, and have not taken it appropriately. For example, take one tablet at the same time every day. There is a possibility that an individual could think, okay, maybe I should put this, for example, in my vaginal area. Or for example, we do know that for suppositories, individuals have said to take a suppository as needed, and they have actually taken them by mouth instead of putting them um, in the appropriate place. Please consider. Also, for the individual representing the use of the realm, I would like to know, were you aware that the realm is actually not considered a multi-dimensional construct measurement of health literacy, and that it is mostly for a measurement of pronunciation and literacy, not comprehension. 
Have you considered that your estimations of low literacy in this sample were actually underreported based on more construct measures, or excuse me, more complex measures of health literacy? Please respond and thank you. Yes, I'd like to ask Dr. Bradford to address that. Thank you, Dr. Hahn. Uh, Russell Bradford from Pegasus Research. Indeed, uh, as you note, uh, the realm is uh, it simply measures one very limited aspect of, of literacy. However, it is widely used in, in prescription to OTC switch programs and recommended in FDA guidance. It's been the industry standard and in fact was used by FDA in their own label comprehension for OTC naloxone. Uh, having said that, uh, the point that you make, I think, is very uh, is very uh, poignant because, indeed, our our we expect that our estimations of low literacy based on the realm are, are likely underestimate actual limited literacy, as as there are. Uh, as you note, many elements that comprise literacy, and therefore um, our estimates estimates of low literacy uh, are are likely low compared to uh, a more extensive evaluation. I would like the committee to please note that there are published. Uh uh, research documents that do indicate that the realm does significantly, or at least compared to other measures, underestimate low literacy in diverse populations. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Hahn. I'd like to move on to Dr. Shaw. Did you have an additional clarifying question for HRA Pharma? Uh, no, my questions were answered. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I will uh, then move on to Dr. Datto to offer you an opportunity for any further clarifying questions for HRA. Thank you, um, Mark Dado here. Um, once again, to the sponsor, uh, yesterday I believe Dr. Shaw had uh, asked the FDA about the self-selection analyses used. I'm curious, uh, what was your rationale for differing with the agency? Uh, I appreciate Dr. Murray's comment at the beginning, but I'd also like to understand uh, what, what communications went between you and the agency uh, to align on that, that's question one. Uh, second question, my last question. Uh, yesterday, there was a lot of discussion about the 30%, let's say, overreporting reporting uh, improbable use users, somehow impugning the data on the 70% that did not over-report. Uh, my question is, is there existent data uh, that lends to that hypothesis, or is this just a general concern uh, based on that? And also noted the Office of Scientific uh, uh, Investigations um, found source data matching uh, existent data. Those are my questions. I look forward to your response. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, our uh, self-selection endpoint definitions and the planned analysis were pre-specified in our protocol and in the a statistical analysis plan to include both the self-selection and purchase question. Detailed study methodology, including the definitions and statistical analysis plan for all endpoints were submitted via a 2019 type C meeting, which occurred before study execution. Uh, this is our specific uh, comment uh, that I'm showing to you uh, where we asked uh, uh, the FDA for feedback. This excerpt from the briefing doc document highlights both our definition of a selector and our efforts to elicit feedback from FDA. Please note that the choice was the name of our actual use study before it was renamed to ACCESS. Um, the responses from FDA did not include any discussion or recommendations regarding the pre-specified definition of a selector or regarding the pre-specified physician review of appropriate for use. So I'd like to ask Dr. Bradford to discuss uh, why we chose uh, this uh, information. Russell Bradford from Pegasus Research. FDA's selection uh, guidance states that analysis should be done based on responses to the self-selection question. It also states that the purchase question can be informative and should only be asked after the self-selection question, which is what we did. 
Um, I have decades of experience doing these studies, but you, you really don't have to observe very many self-selection interviews to understand that the okay or not okay response to the self-selection question alone is not sufficient to understand if a participant is indeed a selector. Um, uh, I showed you some examples of this yesterday, uh, and, and many interpret the selection question as if it's asking about likability of the product. Therefore, to fully understand, we defined a participant as a selector based on verbatim responses to the selection question, the purchase question, and importantly, the reasons given for those responses. Indeed, uh, the reasons are critical uh, for clarifying selection intent. As you heard, we pre-specified this approach and further, it is not unique. Uh, I've personally been involved with a number of self-selection studies beginning at least 10 years ago, which have followed this self-selection classification approach with protocols uh, reviewed by FDA. Dr. Dato, you had a second question. Uh, your second question was uh, in relationship to the um, validity of the people who were, or reliability of the data from the non-over reporters. And I'd like to ask Dr. Stone to address that for you. Author Stone, University of Southern California. I want to reinforce the point that over-reporting in published adherence studies is known to occur. And we simply do not know what causes over-reporting. However, in terms of the non-overreporting group, we can exclude a number of causes of overreporting. It was not related to the e-diary use or the e-diary recall period. My review indicates that the overreporting was actually a decision made by certain individuals for individual reasons. Thus, in my view, there's no reason for questioning the data from the non-overreporters and their data should be considered informative. If we were to throw out the group of non-over-reporters in this case, we are really questioning all previous studies based on self-report data. And I just don't think that's justified. Thank you. Thank you, no more questions. Thank you. Um, I see that Dr. Espy, you have your hand raised. I'd like to give you the floor. Thank you, Eve Espy, University of New Mexico. Uh, this was a question for Dr. Stone, actually very similar to the one that was just asked, because it does seem that the concerns about, you know, over-reporting improbable dosing are key to the concerns with the data uh, to the point of, you know, essentially negating the re reliability of the study. Um, so the the and FDA has um, mentioned that that the that the design and interpretation were extremely um, you know sort of different from the norm. So my question for Dr. Stone, who uh, appeared to to feel that 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 was not the case, is um, you know on uh, you know how on what do you uh, base your um, your thought that this is so different from the way that the FDA interpreted this? Dr. Stone. Author Stone, USC. I have about 45 years of experience working with diary studies and momentary studies. So when I looked at the access trial and tried to understand what was going on with the overreporting, I asked myself the question, is there anything special about the design of access that would encourage overreporting? Anything special over and above what happens in most diary studies that I know of? And I could find nothing in particular. And I would also mention that the root cause analysis indicated that there was nothing operationally wrong about how the diary study was conducted. So for those reasons, I have confidence in the non-overreporting uh, set of data. Thank you, my question is answered. Thank you. Um, I would like to uh, acknowledge Dr. Horn from FDA. Thank you, Pamela Horn. Okay. I'd like to give um, Barbara Cohen an opportunity to uh, respond to some of the comments. Thank you, Dr. Horn. Uh, I'm requesting the slide be put up where you had the excerpt of the communication with FDA. Could you put that back up? Yes. Thank you. 
So I just want to uh, point out, uh, this was a very complicated study logistically. It, there were many, many moving pieces to this. On a chart of the uh, process of this study would take up more than one screen. And so the line, subjects who do not eventually complete the purchase dispensing, we interpreted in a different way than apparently uh, the sponsor meant it. And that's all I wanted to say. We thought that that was much further in the process, maybe for people who had to be excluded. And they were looking at, you know, why they said they wanted to purchase. But we did not interpret that. It was vaguely worded. And so we did not interpret it in that way. These things sometimes happen when things are not clear. Uh, the other thing I want, uh, the other uh, two points I wanted to make was one, I think we need to remember that even before our reanalysis, the deselection endpoint was 75%, which was already uh, below the, considerably below the 90% threshold. And I also want to state that uh, I'm not going to go through all the examples that the sponsor gave, but just for one of them, he uh, gave an example of um, why would women who couldn't uh, bear children say that they were appropriate to use the product? Well, actually, if you look at the verbatims, they said that because they didn't want to use the product for contraception. They wanted to use it to regulate their periods. And so they did think it was appropriate to use. And, you know, again, I just wanted to add that uh, clarification. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Um, I am just taking a scan among our participant list. I don't see any other hands raised. If our uh, panel panel uh, members have any clarifying questions for HRA Pharma, we do have a minute or two to address those right now. Uh, Dr. Bauer, please go ahead. Thank you, Cynthia Bauer, University of Maryland. So question for the sponsor. The briefing document references uh, seven years and 14 consumer studies. I couldn't find dates over which those um, studies were conducted. So if I could get um, a sense of the time span for those 14 consumer studies. Yes, I'll have Dr. Gaillard uh, address that. Yes, uh, let me show you Ellen Guillard. Let me show you uh, the different studies that uh, we did to test uh, the label. Uh, and this, uh, in fact, includes the label compunction study that we did on the DFL and on the CIL, as well as uh, the main AUT and the final the combined study. So it does not include the full 14, but uh, you can see still many of them, uh, and that started in 2015. Uh, so many studies uh, on the liberal compensation study for the DFL were done between 2015 and uh, 2017, uh, while we also conducted the CIL development in 16 and 17, and then the access study was conducted between 2019 and 21, and the final study in 21. So if uh, you could just clarify them, between 2015 and 2017, all of those were just trying to clarify the language uh, to enhance comprehension? Exactly. So that was iterative, like each round was trying to improve on the one exactly. before. Exactly, yeah, that was really the iterative um, process to develop the label. And your briefing document references that FDA gave feedback on your uh, consumer materials. Is there, could you characterize what the nature of that feedback was? During those years, you mean? I don't know. The briefing document just references that FDA gave feedback on the label and on the consumer information leaflet. So I was just wondering if you could characterize what the nature of that feedback was. Yes. So we received... Um in uh, our early studies, uh, responses to, uh, the, uh, to, to, our, uh, to the label that we initially suggested. And, uh, and then after, uh, in fact, while we were um, finishing the access actual use data uh, study, 
uh, we received uh, feedback uh, from FDA to incorporate a, a number of additional uh, revision on the label. And uh, this is also why we amended uh, the final uh, label that we tested in the final uh, pivotal DFL, uh, LCS. So, uh, for instance, um, FDA asks us that we um, modify the, the warning on the breast cancer um, as, a, as a do not use that is very specific uh, for breast cancer. Uh, we also changed the drug-drug interaction so that the list of specific medications are only appear on the CIL and not on the DFL. Uh, we had also rewarding uh, about the vaginal bleeding uh, uh, information. And they also asked us to uh, change subheadings uh, for the situations that required immediate medical attention. Um, they wanted us to ask a specific section about when to use a condom. That's examples. Great, thank you very much. So I'm not sure if this, if we save this for the questions that will be presented to us, but I think it's very interesting if FDA then would gave you feedback on a couple of the items that proved to be the most challenging from a comprehension perspective. Because it was the, the cancer uh, information and the vaginal bleeding that showed up as being particularly difficult to comprehend. Is that, am I remembering correctly from yesterday's presentation? Well, ultimately, we believe the cancer warning was uh, very well understood. But uh, yes, there is always iterative back and forth with FDA. And of course, we're still uh, very open to further discussions on proposed labeling. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to uh, call on Dr. Shaw. Please go ahead. Hello, um, Pamela Shaw. Uh, I think I'd like to um, ask a question of the person, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, that, that responded about the quality of the self-report and the over-reporting. Um, it was just on maybe five, 10 minutes ago, talking about how the um, over-reporting, this study is similar to, to uh, many other studies um, in the 45 years of his experience. Uh, do people know who I mean? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yeah. but my my question is this, uh, you know, my understanding is in this study access that, that um, it was e-diaries uh, that people were using, and those are relatively new and have an, their own set of problems. And my understanding is there were issues with the reminder structure in the sense that people could be reminded to take, to enter their information up to 10 days, um, or let me, let me say this differently, they would be reminded um, to enter their information, even if they had already done it, it was sort of automatic reminders. So that's the first question. I'm really trying to understand how many times people could be reminded. Um, and specifically, I think there was a 10 days they could go back and enter. So my question, my second question is not only how many times they're being reminded, but when they say they hadn't used the app in 10 days and they're going to go enter, did they have to enter each of the previous days that they missed and therefore had to remember quite a number before they could try to enter the current day. So I I know we have a lot to discuss today, but so just some clarity on how many times people could be reminded and if they were required once um, to enter days that they missed, or at least to bypass those days in order to enter a current day. I will uh, address the clarifications about the operational details of the study. And then, of course, I'll bring Dr. Stone up to address uh, his experiences in looking at uh, these studies and oral contraceptive studies. So the reminder was a standardized reminder. Everybody received the reminder every uh, four days. It was a reminder to complete the diary, not to fill out, to take, take your medication. Um, the purpose of the reminder was to decrease uh, missing data. And yes, when people did not complete their diary, they, uh, on any day, when they did open it to complete it, they were asked to go back to the previous days. And as you heard, about 80% of the days were reported uh, within three days of, of taking the medication. 
Also, the diary was very specific as to what day and date they were entering, and they had the pill pack in front of them as well, which also has, uh, well, they have the pill pack as an uh, a assistant to remind them if they needed it on what they did on any particular day. Um, Dr. Stone? Uh, Author Stone, USA. I, I think that we have to remember the context of this trial. This was not an efficacy trial with all kinds of controls and reminders. A study I would typically do might remind people every day to put in their data and someone missed it, I would get on the phone with them and get them to put it in. This was an AUT trial, so a bunch of compromises were made in order to accommodate this kind of trial. One of the things that was done was to use the electronic diary and if people hadn't entered data into the diary for a few days, they could enter um, past days. Now, the issue there is how much recall is too much for this kind of data. And I want to point out in this slide, which I believe uh, was shown earlier, uh, that most of the data, 80% of it, was reported within three days. And in my experience, that seems to be a reasonable amount of time for reporting information about taking a pill or not. Relatively little data was reported at the extremes, as you can see in this distribution. So um, I think this all had to do with the compromises that were made for an AUT trial. Okay, thank you. Uh, no further questions. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Roth, I do see your hand up, but before I call on you, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Horn uh, to step in to respond to an earlier question. Dr. Horn. Thank you, um, Pamela Horn, DNPD2, FDA. I'd like to ask um, Dr. Michelle to um, respond um, to a previous question. Hi, thank you. I'm Teresa Michelle, Director, Office of Non-Prescription Drugs. So I just wanted to circle back to this question of over-reporting. And again, I think it's been brought up several times now, whether this is something that is just a normal course of events that we expect for every study. I want to emphasize again that while you may have an occasional over-reporter in a study, the thing that is particularly unique about this study is that the extent of the over-reporting, I can't think of a study that has 30% invalid data. That really just does not occur in any kind of a study, much less a consumer study of this nature. So it's really very extraordinary. The other thing that I wanted to note is that we went back and asked the sponsor to look for a root cause of this, and they didn't find one. So there was not some systemic issue with, you know, data in the study that we could point to and therefore go in and say, okay, these data were bad for this reason, but we know the other data were good. Instead, we're left with this ambiguity. So those are the things that I wanted to just make sure that we had clearly on the table. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Michelle. Uh, Dr. Roth, please go ahead with your question. Um, my question is, we're talking about birth control pills. Could you please state your full name for the record? Oh, sorry, this is Catalin Roth, uh, George Washington University. Uh, we're talking about birth control pills, which come in a package labeled day one through day 28. And people, when they're taking these pills, can look at the pills and see if they took the pills. So the statistical problem that we're talking about is not about reporting adverse effects. It's not about reporting uh, unintended pregnancies. It's only about whether the women in the study accurately reported or over-reported whether or not they took the pills. Is that correct? 
And I guess let me just um, follow up by saying that I really appreciated Dr. Shaw's comment uh, because I personally was in participated in a vaccine trial in the last few years, and I found the electronic reminders extremely difficult to use. And um, and I think as a physician, I would be a relatively sophisticated user. I use a lot of apps on my phone, but I could imagine many ways in which overreporting could occur. Um, in an effort to try and comply with the study. Uh, I'm, that's all I want to say, but I would appreciate clarifying exactly what it is we are spending time about. Thank you. Uh, the question has been uh, raised about uh, the validity of the data in the over uh, because of overreporting, and uh, we have as uh, as was. Dr. Michelle told you there was no systematic problems in the study. And if you choose to exclude anybody who did overreporting, we shared that analysis with you. And I will show that to you again, uh, right alongside our primary analysis, which showed you that people do understand how to take one pill a day and that they uh, follow the label directions. Um, Dr. Stone can uh, address uh, as well your question. Author Stone, USC. I, I agree with the statement that this amount of overreporting is not usually seen in such trials. There's usually a little bit of overreporting. But the reason that there's more overreporting in access is because the very rare conditions to allow for overreporting of this time existed. And that is that the sponsor allowed people to continue to use the diary when there weren't any pills available to them. That's an extraordinary circumstance that happens. It's happened a few times in the past. Uh, the Oxitrol trial was one example of that. So when the conditions are right, people do this kind of overreporting, but it is rare. And it's rare because the conditions do not exist for it to be seen very often. Can I follow up that my question? Yes, and you are correct. There is no safety issue being assessed. Uh, yeah. So is it possible that these um, women were able to secure additional pills? Are all of the, is all of the over-reporting, did it all occur after? they finished the study or between the times that they were picking up the pills at the designated sites when they may have not had any available pills? Can you tell whether the overreporting occurred at times when the participants did not have pills available to them? And uh, that concludes my question. Thank you. Uh, we uh, did look into uh what happened at the sites and the drug accountability at the sites was correct. So we do not think that people got an, uh, additional pills. Importantly, let me show you again the sensitivity analysis uh, that where we uh, use a revised stop date. This is the information we have on when people may have reported to the um, nurse interviewer or um, sorry, or uh, otherwise indicated that they had stopped taking the drug. So the uh, diary may have remained open, but they had indicated that they had stopped taking the drug. And so now uh, if we were to look at any restrictions on uh, reporting in the diary based on drug availability, this is what you would see as the results uh, indicating adherence is very high. Thank you. Dr. Roth, does that address your question? It's helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I don't see any further hands raised from our panelists, but I do want to offer an opportunity uh, for HRA Pharma. I think they did have some uh, responses to some of the clarifying questions from day one. Um, so I would be interested to hear from uh, our sponsor which clarifying questions they wanted to address. We have just a few minutes, so perhaps uh, if there are one or two that are more pressing, 
Um, and then you can uh, maybe share that information with the panelists. Uh, yes, we had some clarifying questions. I think it uh, first was about uh, our uh, interactions with FDA during the course of the development, and that was clarified. But uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Glacier also to clarify what we know about real-world use um, of oral contraceptives. Thank you, Dr. Glazier from Scotland. A question was asked yesterday about what a woman who has been prescribed an oral contraceptive understands about adherence when she leaves a prescriber's office. There are no data specifically on what US women understand, but there are data on how they behave. So two studies present daily diary adherence data detailed by cycle. Dr. Fox and colleagues in 2003 found that over three months of treatment, only 50% of subjects were 100% adherent. And in cycle three, 18% missed three or more pills, despite being sent daily email reminders. And a study done in 1996 by Potter and colleagues found similar variability and levels of non-adherence. And it's this level of non-adherence in the prescription setting that you need to use to put in context the data from the ACCESS study. Thank you. Uh, no other clarifying uh, statements. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, we will move on to uh, follow up with a few additional clarifying questions for FDA. These um, are questions that we did not get to yesterday in our discussion. And if we have a few minutes, we will open it up for further clarifying questions. Uh, so please use the raise hand icon if needed. And um, also remember to state your name for the record before you speak, to direct your question to a specific presenter if possible, uh, including a specific slide if you have that information. And uh, please to acknowledge the end of your question with a thank you um, so that we can move on to the next panel member. Uh, we will begin uh, with Dr. Curtis. Good, good morning and thank you. Um, I have two questions um, left over from yesterday. One is, um, can FDA help us think about how to interpret the comprehension and actual use data in the over-the-counter setting? So for example, is it typical that all subgroups would meet or approach the thresholds, or is it mainly the overall study population that we would expect to meet the thresholds? Um, and of course, it's important um, to work hard to make sure all the subgroups meet those thresholds, but I'm wondering what's typical in the, um, for approval. Thank you for that question, Dr. Curtis. Um, I'm going to um, ask, this is Pamela Horn, DNPD2, um, and I'd like to ask um, Dr. Levinson um, to take that question. Hello, uh, hello, this is Mark Levinson, Office of Biostatistics, Cedar FDA. Uh, typically, when we look at subgroups, we don't expect them all to meet the threshold, but we're looking for consistency, and we want to ensure that no subgroup is particularly worse. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Um, and then my second question is a, a follow-up point made yesterday about comparisons um, for the comprehension and actual use findings with what we know about the prescription setting. Um, and Dr. Glazier actually just um, addressed this issue as well, um, but I wanted to give um, FDA the chance to address that also. Um, it sounds like we don't have much of that information, but I do think it's important to consider the thresholds that we're using and where they came from. Um, it was pointed out yesterday that um, current POP users in the U.S. are a select group, and so if we had data from them, they probably wouldn't be representative of those who might be using oak pill over the counter. Um, but we do have some data, as Dr. Glazier just mentioned, um, for combined oral contraceptives, and the, the use instructions are fairly similar. Um, and I believe that the 85% threshold for taking ev pills every day in the access study was based on the typical adherence for combined oral contraceptives. Um, so my question is, are there other comparative data that were used um, or that exist, especially for adolescents? Um, and if not, then I think it is important to consider that we don't really know whether the data that we're reviewing um, today uh, reflect comprehension and behavior that would be better, worse, or similar to what's seen in the prescription um, setting. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Curtis. Um, Pamela Horn, DNPD2. I'd actually like to invite HRA Pharma to comment on if there were other um, considerations uh, that they took into account or other data um, to support the threshold that they chose, and also to ask them to comment on what considerations um, they used for the adolescent um, consumers that they were going to be enrolling and how they um, applied the 85% threshold um, to them. So adherence to um, all types of daily uh, medications is less than what we would want it to be. Uh, as per, if we were um, hoping, as pe we hope people would take it. So we looked very carefully at the all the data on adherence, and the main data on adherence using diary studies was presented to you by Dr. Uh, Glazier. But there were other studies that we looked at, and they found very similar data showing that people um, are le missing at least one pill a week in their uh, current daily oral contraceptives. Uh, importantly, we also consider the um, benefit in uh, deciding whether or not this type of adherence would still uh, maintain a significant benefit in the uh, potential OTC setting. And we feel very strongly it will. And uh, we really would like to discuss specifically the benefit in adolescence and, um, and how we uh, considered uh, the potential uh, barriers that they have to access as well. Um, Dr. Wilkinson? Um, I'm Dr. Tracy Wilkinson. I'm pediatric faculty at Indiana University School of Medicine and a practicing general pediatrician. Um, I would like to remind the panel about the data that we saw um, about adolescents' use of contraception before entering the study and how 60% of them were using no contraception and 26% were using the least effective form of contraception. We know that adolescents face significant barriers to access and have significant unintended pregnancy rates and that 30% of first births in the United States occur during teenage years. Um, I also would like to note that this medication is FDA approved currently without any age restrictions or length of use. Um, having over-the-counter access to an effective form of contraception would significantly improve access for adolescents. Thank you. Um, Dr. Horn, can I uh, ask you to uh, step back in to the conversation? Yes, thank you, um, Pamela Horn, DNPD2. Um, I'd like to ask Dr. Wynn to um, also uh, provide a response to Dr. Curtis's question. Hi, Christine Wynn, CDOR FDA. Um, so thank you for that question, uh, Dr. Horn. Um, I'd like to just point out a couple of very important differences. I understand Dr. Glazier had quoted some literature about adherence. Uh, with combined birth control pills. And as Dr. Kotak mentioned yesterday, uh, the progesterone-only pill is less forgiving um, for the reasons that were discussed. It's once daily and at the same time, allowing for a three-hour window. And um, it, it's obviously the, the, the side effects, so to say, when adherence is not stringent is an unintended pregnancy. So um, missing a pill with COCs versus a uh, progesterone-only pill may differ as far as the risk for unintended pregnancy. Another consideration I'd like to raise that we haven't really discussed is, unlike condoms when you don't use them, you're clearly at risk for pregnancy and you can choose to use emergency contraception in a timely manner. If one is taking a pill every day but not taking it at the same time every day, um, that risk of pregnancy may not be self-evident and there is a missed opportunity to take emergency contraception in a timely manner. So for adolescents, I think that's particularly important to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Curtis, did that address your questions? Yes, thank you very much. 
Thank you. I'd like to, to move on to um, Dr. Bauer. I believe you had questions from yesterday. Thank you, Cynthia Bauer, uh, University of Maryland. So my question is to the FDA team. So the question that you posed to the uh, committee members is uh, really based on the consumer information that uh, they would have to make this decision. So my question is, as part of our deliberations, are we um, are you looking for us to make recommendations about changes, specific changes to the consumer information, whether that's on the label or the leaflet or anything else? Um, or are you really asking us to consider what's been presented by the sponsor as is and just consider whether the current versions are adequate to uh, for informed decision making? Thank you for that question. This is Pamela Horn, DNPD2. Um, just wanted to remind um, the committee that um, one of the points I made yesterday is that um, the proposed labeling, if it were to have um, major changes made to it, we would expect that those uh, changes would need to be tested again prior to approval. So we do want the committee's input on what they think of the labeling and its adequacy. Um, but I just wanted to make that point about the, um, the, the need for those, any changes that are substantive to be tested prior to approval. And I want to invite Dr. Murray to also um, add on to that if she has additional comments. And could you both clarify what you mean by substantive changes? So that would help us understand what those parameters are. Karen Murray, Deputy Director, Office of Non-Prescription Drugs. Um, as an overall matter, we would ask the committee to consider the labeling as it has already been tested, the labeling as it already stands and it has already been tested. If the committee feels that um, changes are necessary to the labeling in order to ensure safe and effective use in the U.S. non-prescription environment, we would expect that the committee would then be um, stating that the application as presented as inadequate and that um, the sponsor would need to go back, change the labeling, retest, and resubmit an application. That's what we, we would expect. So um, please consider the application and the labeling as it already stands and has already been tested. Okay, I think it would be really helpful just to make sure that the committee knows exactly which versions we're looking at because I found a different version in the briefing materials versus in the slides yesterday. So I just want to make sure that we're looking at the correct ones when we uh, consider those things. Um, and one other follow-up question. Um, I noted that FDA held a workshop on June 9, 2021 to consider updates to the drug facts label, and there were a number of experts who testified about improvements and specifically some of the issues that are being discussed today in the sponsor's application. I'm just wondering, was any of that information from the workshop part of your discussions with the sponsor before and leading up to today's uh, committee meetings? Karen Murray, Deputy Director, Office of Non-Prescription Drugs. Uh, uh, to, no, um, it was not, and the reason for that is because the vast majority of the interactions that we had with the sponsor regarding this occurred prior to that meeting. Um, we've been meeting with and giving advice to the sponsor on this since at least 2016. We met with them and sent advice letters to them on at least 13 occasions um, with many, many pages of advice. Um, but. Uh, but no, um, we um, did not give them specific advice related to future iterations of what the drug facts labeling might look like overall. Um, they were working within the construct of what is currently in regulation. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bauer. Uh, I will call on Dr. Uh, Barone. 
Hi, Elma Barron here. Um, my question is actually in a different aspect of the study. Um, yesterday, we heard from one of the FDA presenters that the study had a very high attrition rate. I think it was 46% broken down into 21% um, withdrawal and 25% loss to follow-up. Um, can someone elaborate on this and potential reasons? Because that's as a clinical investigator, to me, that's a little concerning. Um, of course, there is no set, uh, like I cannot give a specific number um, as to what is considered appropriate as far as attrition rate. It depends on the study design, the condition being uh, studied and all that. But um, in general, when we see uh, attrition rate of higher than 20%, we uh, would like to know further what was what caused that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Barron. This is Pamela Horn, DNPD2. Could you please bring up slide 129? One hundred twenty nine. Doctor Barron, is this the slide you were referring to? Okay. Um, Just waiting to see if it is this the slide you were referring to, Dr. Barron. Um, yes, it is. I believe this is it. Okay, thank you. One percent withdrawal and twenty five percent loss to follow up. Uh, okay, um, I'm going to ask Dr. Jacob to um, comment on uh, the disposition for access. Thank you, Gina Jacob, Medical Officer, Division of Non-Prescription Drugs, too. So as you can see from the slide, 25% um, were lost to follow-up. We do not know why those participants did not complete the study. In terms of the 21% that withdrew from the study, 60% um, provided the reason that they withdrew due to the subject deciding they wanted to discontinue use of the product. Um, there were a significant number of the participants who were in that um, category who did discontinue due to adverse events. And then another 24% provided the reason of discontinuation due to adverse events. Um, all of the adverse events that were reported in the subgroup that decided to withdraw due to um, decision to discontinue as well as withdraw to an adverse event were accounted for in the overall discontinuations of the study. And that made up of 7% of the user population that discontinued the study drug due to an adverse event. Um, in terms of the remaining participants that withdrew from the study, um, five cited the reason of uh, COVID um, reasons due to COVID-19. We don't have any more information regarding that. Um, 11 withdrew consent. Um, two withdrew due to their, their own personal physician, um, basically making the decision with, you know, um, in conjunction with the participant that the participant needed to withdraw from the study. Um, eight provided the reason of withdrawn because they were, um, they were pregnant. And um, four had a protocol violation as the cited reason. Thank you, Dr. Jacob. Um, I, I just want to call your attention, Dr. Barron, to the, the last row. Um, 
where uh, there were only 46% of participants who had a known end-of-study home pregnancy test result. I think that that was concerning to us um, in terms of uh, there being a, a lot of missing information about um, what we knew about pregnancy outcomes from this study and, you know, combining that with um, uh, the concerns that we had with uh, the self-report um, data, I, I think it, it does um, raise a lot of concern for us about what we know about the outcomes from this study. Um, in terms of actual use study uh, dispositions in general, there are definitely examples of actual use studies where there's much um, higher completion rates and much less dropout than what we saw in this study. But, um, you know, the, the actual use studies uh, span a wide range of different um, conditions and indications. And so, um, you know, it's kind of hard to make um, much uh, comparison in that way. Um, we do, uh, I, I can invite my um, colleagues to talk about uh, completion rates and discontinuation rates in uh, contraceptive efficacy studies. Um, so I'll um, uh, send that over to Dr. Gassman. Audrey Gassman, Deputy Director in the Division of Urology, Obstetrics, and Gynecology. Um, although um, we don't, uh, you know, we have not had a, a recent uh, large contraceptive trial, uh, probably the most recent a uh, comparator for dropout rate in a contraception would be that of SLIND, which is a progesterone-only product where I believe at one year the discontinuation rate was 26%. We do know that um, there is a dropout rate as uh, women may move on to different insurances and are able to select different pills or may move or have other reasons why they want to discontinue contraception. So I think it's difficult to look at an, an individual rate of discontinuation in a contraceptive trial uh, and, and try to, uh, unless you have detailed information, really try to make, uh, you know, make a conclusion on that. Thank you. I can uh, provide some additional information that we do have from this study. Uh, remember that the study was designed to mimic the OTC setting, and so it's not typical to what you would expect in a clinical trial assessing efficacy of a contraceptive. People I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, sponsor. Could you just at least state your name for the record oh, so we know who's speaking? Thank I, you. Yes, uh, Dr. Irene LaRora. Um, so uh, I'd like to show a slide. Uh, okay, we might not be able to. <laughs> um, so, so the study was designed to simulate an OTC setting where people may choose to start a contraceptive and they may choose to stop a contraceptive. So this is the uh, data that shows the continuation rate in access. And after about six months of use, uh, we had about 50% uh, of participants who were still taking the product. And let me show you I'm sorry. Um, uh, this is the reasons why people discontinued, and the most common reason was because they ran out of pills and they couldn't get back to the uh, pharmacy sites to get the pills. And uh, that is precisely, again, the reason why uh, OTC access is so important for continuation of uh, uh, contraceptive use and therefore contraceptive efficacy. And pregnancy. Oh, I'm sorry, and one more clarification. We had pregnancy outcomes, uh, pregnancy tests in 73% of participants by the end of their participation in the study. Thank you. Thank you to our, our sponsor uh, for responding. And as a, a, just a matter of uh, procedure, please raise your hand so that I know to call on you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move on to Mrs. Verbati. <laughs> Hi, thank you. It's actually a follow-up to the last one on slide 129. And, and uh, please, please state your name for the record, the full name. I thought I did. Suzanne Robati. Um, 
follow uh, adverse events with driven study, 50% of, of about half of 21%. Could we get more information on what those adverse events were? This is Pamela Horn, DMPD2. Thanks for that question. Um, yes, I'm going to um, ask Dr. Gina Jacob to um, respond. Thank you, Gina Jacob, Medical Officer, Division of Non-Prescription Drugs Two. The most common adverse events um, that led to um, drug discontinuation were due to bleeding abnormalities. So um, including menorrhagia, metrorrhagia, um, there were several preferred terms that were included in that category, but um, most of them were due to bleeding abnormalities. Sponsor, would you like to add some information to that question? I'd like Dr. Sober to address your question. Stephanie Sober. There were, in the study, um, there were 7% of participants who discontinued due to an adverse event, and of those, less than 5% discontinued due to any bleeding changes. Thank you. Did that address your question, Ms. Brabati? Oh, what were the adverse events? Was it nausea, cramps, uh, any color there? Yes, Dr. Uh, so were there hospitalizations? Were I can show you in just a moment, Stephanie Sober. I can show you in just a moment, um, as soon as I have the slide, um, the list of the most common adverse events reported during the study. So as you can see here, this is the list of the most common event, adverse events reported. And the most frequent events were changes in menstrual bleeding, which is expected and consistent with the known side effect profile of the product. And the most frequent of those was still only reported at about 5% of the population. In terms of other adverse events, Oh, okay. Thank you. Sure. I, I guess uh, I was. I, what I heard, and perhaps I heard incorrectly, was that twenty-one percent withdrew. Fifty percent of those who withdrew, it was because of adverse events. It sounds more like you know a third of those who withdrew uh, had an adverse had adverse events. I'm sorry, did, did we not answer your question? Can you put that again? And, and, no, I, ju I, just, I just wanted to clarify why I was asking the question. I, in, in slide 129, my understanding was that the 20, of the 21% who withdrew, half of those were uh, withdrew because of adverse events. 7% so would really reflect 30, you know, a third of them. So I'm just trying to clarify, was it a half, was it a third? It's a small differential. I'm probably splitting a hair there, so I'll let it go. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Rabadi. I'm going to call on uh, Ms. Everhart as our last question for this uh, uh, section. Thank you, Sabrina Everhart. My question is, for those who withdrew or were lost, is there um, an age breakdown of those percentages, and if there is, could you uh, please provide that? Thank you. Okay, this is Pamela Horn, um, CNPD2. Um, I just want to restate the question. Um, thank you for that. Uh, the question, if I understood it correctly, was, um, do we have um, the discontinuations in the study broken down by age group? Yes. We, we could ask um, HRA if they have a slide handy to uh, give the breakdown um, by age. We'd invite them to, to put that up. Thank you. I have no more questions. Yes, uh, I have that data, and this is the uh, 
what we look at at the continuation rate by age. So you can uh, see the progression of people through the study based on age, and uh, we really uh, didn't see that there was uh, significant differences uh, by age. Thank you. Uh, thank you to both uh, FDA and uh, the sponsor for uh, indulging those additional questions and helping us understand uh, the data before us uh, to an even greater degree. We appreciate that very much. Uh, Dr. Horn, did you have any final comments? Yes, thank you, Dr. Coyle. Um, I just wanted to respond to um, a question of from Dr. Bauer earlier um, asking um, us to point her to and the rest of the committee to the proposed label submitted. Um, I can refer you to page 77 of the briefing document, the FDA briefing document, um, which has uh, that information for you to use. And then also um, I wanted to um, respond to a question from yesterday that we uh, didn't have um, a full answer to um, from Dr. Walker-Harris about um, previous contraceptive use in uh, adolescents in the access study. So I wanna invite Dr. Jacob to, um, to add to our response from yesterday with respect to that. Thank you, Gina Jacob, medical officer from Division of Non-Prescription Drugs 2. Um, so in response to Dr. Walking, Walker Harding's question yesterday regarding prior oral contraceptive use, prior to the start of the ACCESS study, um, we would like to note that 16% of the participants in the 12 to 14 age group and 34% in the 15 to 17 age group had a history of prior oral contraceptive use. Thank you, that's all from us. Thank you, Dr. Horn. Uh, so our work will now proceed to the charge to the committee. So I will invite Dr. Horn back uh, to, the, to the stage. Thank you. So um, I'm going to give the charge to the committee now and ask the committee to discuss the questions and the vote. Um, I once again want to emphasize that we recognize the many challenges that women of reproductive potential face in accessing contraception in the U.S. currently and the importance of making decisions that it will enhance women's health. The public hearing yesterday was filled with courageous, compelling stories testifying to these challenges. We support women's autonomy and empowerment in making their own decisions with the best information available. When an applicant applies to change a drug available price prescription to non-prescription, the applicant is required to provide data to demonstrate that the benefits of the drug will continue to outweigh the risks. And we owe it to women of reproductive potential in the U.S. to ensure that the data the applicant provided is sufficient to support the likelihood of safe and effective use without interaction with a healthcare provider, and that the data demonstrate that labeling has been optimized to support this use. And that is our charge to the committee this morning as well. Next slide. So having said that, our first discussion question for the committee is to discuss whether consumers are likely to use norgestrel tablet in a safe and effective manner, considering the possibility of unintended pregnancy with incorrect use. And we'd specifically like the committee to talk about uh, the need to adhere to taking the tablet at the same time of day and based only on the non-prescription labeling without any counseling or advice from a healthcare professional. Um, we'd like the committee to specifically talk about the general population that's targeted, as well as um, what we know from the application about um, the likelihood 
for this uh, safe and effective use in adolescents and in consumers with limited literacy. And then we'd also like uh, the committee to discuss specifically uh, the implications of potential use um, of norgestrel along with concomitant drugs that may interact and reduce efficacy of norgestrel. Next slide. Our discussion question two, um, it pertains to actual use study design. Um, and we've talked extensively about um, the findings of the access study. And so we would like the committee, if they have thoughts or recommendations on actual use study design in this therapeutic area, whether they could please comment on um, the following different aspects of study design for actual use studies. The e-diary design, the e-diary recall period, that's allowed, um, compensation structure for participants, methods to ensure that the entry instructions for any diary in a study are adequately comprehended, and the potential to incorporate a pathway to allow participants to talk to a healthcare provider before deciding about a drug purchase and study questions to determine the timing of when participants spoke to a healthcare provider to inform assessment of endpoints that include uh, assessment of that action and behavior by participants. Next slide. Our third discussion question is uh, targeted on um, safety. So we would like the committee to discuss whether um, there's sufficient information to conclude that consumers with a history or current diagnosis of breast cancer or other progestin sensitive cancer um, would deselect from use, whether uh, consumers with abnormal vaginal bleeding of undiagnosed etiology would take the appropriate action based on the messages in the DFL and whether uh, consumers who are using other hormonal contraceptives would take the appropriate action based on the DFL messages. Next slide. And then finally, our voting question. Um, we would like the committee to vote as to whether they think that there's adequate information to conclude that consumers will be likely to use norgestrel tablet properly, such that the benefits of making this product available without a prescription and without the need to interact with a healthcare professional exceed the risks. And uh, paramount among those risks are the risk of inadequate adherence leading to contraceptive failure and unintended pregnancies, uh, the risk that use of the medication um, by consumers with a contraindication to its use, and the failure to see a healthcare professional when appropriate. And then if you vote no, we'd like you to explain your vote and what additional data would be necessary to support approval. And if you vote yes, we'd like you to explain why you think the benefits outweigh the risks and are likely to um, continue to out, have the benefits outweighing the risks in non-prescription setting. So if possible, we'd like you to um, not change the wording of our questions and try to respond to the questions as they are worded. Um, and address the specific issues uh, that we have outlined in these questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Horn. The committee will now turn its attention to address the task at hand, the careful consideration of the data before the committee, as well as the public comments. 
As we begin uh, to proceed with the questions to the committee and the panel discussions, I'm going to provide just a, a short logistic update. We do have a number of questions, including a voting question to address. So I want to make sure that we get through at least the first question before we break for lunch. Um, and we may take just a, an abbreviated 30 minute lunch. Um, and then we will return after um, that time frame. Uh, also moving through the remaining questions and, and allowing sufficient time for the voting question. So we will sort of be keeping an eye on timing here, but I do want to encourage all members, including those who uh, maybe have not spoken up yet, uh, to, to share their thoughts and concerns uh, as we work through these uh, questions today. Um, I'd like to remind public observers that while this meeting is open, uh, for observation, public attendees may not participate except at the specific request of the panel. Um, as we go through these questions, I will read each question and then we will pause for any questions or comments concerning its wording specifically. After that time, we will then open the question for discussion. Um, so I, I believe I need slide number two from AV support. which is discussion question number one. Thank you. So let me begin by reading the question and asking for any clarifications or comments as to the wording. Discuss whether consumers are likely to use norgesterol tablets in a safe and effective manner, considering the possibility of unintended pregnancy with, correct, with incorrect use. Specifically discuss whether consumers are likely to adhere to taking the tablet daily, at the same time of day, based solely upon the non-prescription labeling without any assistance from a healthcare professional. And then please discuss for the following consumer populations, the general population of females of reproductive potential, adolescents, those with limited literacy, and those using concomitant products, for example, anticonvulsant drugs that may interact with and reduce efficacy of norgesterol tablets. Are there any questions about the wording of the question? Okay, seeing none, I will open up for comments. I'm going to suggest that we deal with these in subparts. So any comments related to the uh, discussion question around the general population of females of reproductive potential? from our panel. Yes, Dr. Armstrong. Um, so I'll break, this is Deb Armstrong from Johns Hopkins. Um, so I'll break the ice a little bit. I think, um, uh, um, the, the data that we have been presented that are from the use of uh, OPIL is that 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 there certainly can be some unintended pregnancies. But um, if one looks at, uh, you know, the data that we that we have that, and that was presented for other options um, uh, for, you know, patient uh, generated um, use for uh, contraception, you know, such as you know the condoms, diaphragm, uh, et cetera, that the incidence of unintended pregnancies uh, is certainly lower, um, and it may not be. It certainly may not be as as good as you know what was in the called the moderately effective um, uh, um, uh, uh, util um, agents, such as um, oral contraceptive under. Un provided under a healthcare provider, patches, rings, injectables, et cetera. Um, but I think it certainly is better than what's available right now for the overall, for the general population. Um, and um, uh, uh, I think um, that, that I just wanted to break the ice and say that's that was my thoughts with regard to the general population. Thank you, Dr. Curtis. Thank you, Kate Curtis, CDC. Um, 
I just wanted to thinking it, we were presented a lot of data and I echo Dr. Shaw's comment yesterday that it, um, it's a little difficult to take all of the disparate um, sponsor and FDA analyses into account. But I think looking overall at the general population, looking over both actual use and the comprehension data and looking at sort of the key endpoints on taking the pill every day, taking at the same time every day, and especially factoring in the mitigating behavior, um, I think we can say for the overall, the general population, um, that at least the, the pill taking behavior and comprehension um, are, are good. I did want to make a comment about the um, delayed pill study presented by the sponsor. Um, to me, those data are reassuring. I, I agree with the FDA that there's certainly not enough data to expand that three hour window. Um, but I do think measuring cervical mucus and ovulation are um, standard measures of proxies for pregnancy risk when pregnancy isn't feasible to measure. Um, and so those data were reassuring to me. Um, so thank you. I apologize, Dr. Berenson. Thank you, Abby Berenson, University of Texas Medical Branch. Um, I would just like to repeat a comment that was made earlier, I believe, by Dr. Curtis, that we have to think about if people take the pill at the same time every day when they do see a provider. And I think all of us that have had experience taking care of adolescents and adult females realize that it is very difficult for people to long-term take even uh, birth control pills when they see a provider the same time every day. So I just think that we should think about the big picture and not just um, the over-the-counter use. So given what's been presented, I feel it is as safely taken without a prescription as it is with a prescription. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Please go ahead. Yes, Pamela Shaw. And I just um, like to add that I, I agree with the statements that were just made by Dr. Curtis and I believe Dr. Berenson. Um, I agree um, that I think for the general population of uh, reproductive, um, of females' reproductive potential, that uh, I believe that it's going to be used um, generally in a safe and effective manner. I looked at um, similar questions um, that were mentioned, the daily use, and also uh, in terms of the disparate analyses, I focused my evaluation on the FDA analysis because I just... Um, I, I did agree with the FDA that there was concerning recategorization, but looking at the FDA analysis, such as this overall selector analysis of the access, table seven, um, I saw that 85% threshold was being met in terms of appropriate selection and um, at least in the point estimate and closely the lower bound, um, not quite, but close. Um, so overall, um, I, I was in taking into account the safety of the progesterone only pill that has been established, uh, I would agree that it would be um, safe and effective. Dr. Hahn, what would you like to add? I would like to um, voice my agreement with my advisory committee members. Um, I do believe that we can all agree that when a physician prescribes birth control pills, these are typically done on an annual basis, if not um, less than that, and that individuals who are prescribed those pills are left to their own vices to take it regularly as instructed, and a prescription will not prevent or support the use of this medication appropriately for these targeted populations on the slide. I also believe that this is a viable option to support access and will support the prevention of unintended and unwanted pregnancies. Thank you.
Dr. Espy, you could go ahead. Thank you, Eve Espy, University of New Mexico. Um, I agree and would just add that I'm not sure that uh, in my mind that there's a big difference between these different categories for the reasons that have been stated before. And that is that, you know, this is a, a medication that was you know, that's been um, approved for quite some time. And so it doesn't seem like the effectiveness is really what we should be considering here, but, but, but uh, the focus should be on safety. And um, when, when we think about, I mean, I don't think we can think about this question outside of the context um, of, of, of what else is available to patients and all of these groups, um, the subgroups, face incredible barriers to being able to access um, uh, to access uh, contraceptive care. And so um, if, if, we, if we agree that the major harms of this medication are very limited uh, and, um, and we, we also don't have evidence uh, that, pres that, that when a patient accesses this care through a provider, that is, that it is much safer, uh, than it is, um, through, um, through self-use and, and looking at the label, uh, that, that, uh, that I agree, um, that there is, that, that this, that the, the data would support, um, that it can be used in a safe manner. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I will call on Dr. Roth with perhaps an encouragement to consider points that have not yet been discussed or haven't been discussed in uh, the depth that you would like around the general population in particular. Um, I'll try. Um, for 20 years, I was a primary care doctor and a primary care program director before going into geriatrics and palliative care. And I think that the uh, safety profile here is very well established. I am very skeptical that most women who get prescribed birth control pills in a clinic or doctor's office setting get very much counseling about how to take the pills and on repeat uh, prescriptions. That probably doesn't happen almost at all. So I think that um, it's really an access issue. We know there's a need. Um, we know that access is even worse than it used to be given a number of uh, socioeconomic factors and disparities. And I, I don't see why the general population of women cannot safely have this medication available over the counter. And um, patients who have medical conditions, I hope, like breast cancer and anticonvulsant therapy for epilepsy are getting medical care and are getting counseling regarding such issues as contraception. And um, so I think that making it available over the counter uh, is, is the right thing for women. I I'm going to stop there, but I appreciate Dr. Berenson's remarks also about what really happens in renewal of birth control pills in the office. Thank you, Dr. Roth. Um, Dr. Bauer, what can you add to the conversation, uh, especially regarding the general population? Sure, Cynthia Bauer, University of Maryland. Um, so I'm looking at the label itself, which is uh, labeled, I guess, version H. And I wanted to um, recommend that we, uh, uh, you know, that we consider Dr. Han's suggestion about adding by mouth, because I think that would apply to audiences A, B, and C, that would be helpful. So take one tablet by mouth at the same time every day. And if it were considered a substantive change, I would not suggest this, but I would consider also adding the word only, take one tablet only by mouth at the same time every day. Because one of the issues uh, Dr. Han raised that uh, there's a lot of confusion around directions. People may not always know what a pill or how a pill might be taken. Um, we also, within health literacy research, know that people sometimes think taking more is better. And so sometimes it's really important to clarify that only one pill should be taken and not multiple. Multiple is not better. So I think that for populations A, B, and C, those additions might be really helpful uh, as part of the labeling. Uh, may I ask um, FDA to comment to what extent um, 
some of the potential upcoming revisions to drug fact labels might impact this product or, or really any product uh, out in the over-the-counter market? In other words, is there going to be an opportunity to sort of further refine the drug facts label for all products in the short term, or is that more of a long-term uh, process? Mary, Deputy Director, Office of Non-Prescription Drugs. <laughs> Uh, that opportunity would not be available in this um, approval cycle, um, you know, because the you know, goal date for this is coming up very quickly. Um, so I wouldn't consider that to be something that would be an option uh, for consideration about whether the product is appropriate for approval in this cycle. Uh, could, could I ask FDA if Thank my... You. Well, I'm just going to say, would they consider the addition of only and by mouth to be substantive changes requiring retesting? Because otherwise, I think that it impacts my uh, recommendation. FDA, can you comment on that? Erin Murray, Deputy Director, Office of Non-Prescription Drugs. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to um, begin um, discussions of um, a variety of minor, uh, supposedly minor uh, suggested changes to the drug facts label as a way to get to a vote of either yes or no by the committee. So again, I would encourage the committee to consider the label only as it is currently written and as it has already been tested. Thank you for, for that clarification. Dr. Hahn, did that answer your question? Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. So I think to summarize our at least initial discussion here, uh, there does seem to be support uh, across the panel uh, of those who have spoken that use of the norgesterol tablet in a safe and effective manner seems very reasonable in the OTC setting, particularly for the general population of females, um, given that there are challenges even to prescription adherence and um, not maybe a general sense that um, that healthcare provider interaction substantially uh, may affect that or may be uh, available in such a way as to make it a necessary component of safe and effective use. Um, I would like to uh, invite anyone who has a, a differing opinion to please raise their hand so that that can be heard if, if necessary, and also to, to move the conversation specifically to the population of adolescents and those with limited literacies, um, and then we'll address the, the final subgroup maybe uh, at the end here. Uh, and I see uh, Dr. Berlin, go ahead. All right, thank you. This is Dr. Elise Berlin from Ohio State University and Nationwide Children's Hospital. And I wanna thank the FDA and the, um, the sponsor for sharing this information and inviting me to participate. I'm an adolescent health expert and this is work I do clinically day in and day out. Um, and so I have just some comments on the question around effectiveness, safety and comprehension by adolescents. But to frame this, you know, access barriers impact adolescents more than anyone else. They are actually healthier than other pregnancy capable persons, and they're at the highest risk for unintended pregnancy. I don't think I have any concerns about the effectiveness of this progestin only contraceptive. The revised Pearl Index in the FDA analysis was 3.4, and that's highly acceptable to me, and it's more effective than any other over the counter contraceptive currently available. I understand the safety to be well established of this product. In terms of the specific questions the FDA raised, with the deselection, I found both measures have some limitations, but overall, the absolute risk of harm to use of this product to adolescents is quite low. In terms of the abnormal vaginal bleeding deselection question, most adolescents with abnormal vaginal bleeding between periods do not have uterine cancer. They have um, anovulation, which is primarily due to pubertal immaturity and not a pathological cause. They may also have a sexually transmitted infection. There's a small risk of missing a pathological cause. Um, however, as bleeding related to an STI will not stop with the POP. Other areas the FDA raised concerns about adolescents include the risk of bone density. And I want to, um, in my 
uh, opinion, professional opinion, the risks related to bone density are low, given the rebounds we see with use of injectable um, progestin contraceptives in adolescents. I'm not concerned about, um, or I'm not particularly concerned about them not understanding the mitigating behaviors, because although that might compromise efficacy, it is not harmful. Um, with the risks related to them understanding the label and taking emergency contraceptive in a timely way, the emergency contraceptive that would be interacting um, harmfully potentially with this contraceptive is the prescription um, emergency contraceptive. So again, it's, it's probably unlikely that someone taking an over-the-counter oral contraceptive would be taking a prescriptive um, emergency contraceptive, which is the ulipristal acetate. And regarding the off-label use that was um, disproportional in adolescents, off-label use happens frequently with prescription oral contraceptives. It is unlikely to be harmful. And I know that's um, not within the label indication, um, but it is unlikely to be harmful And their off-label use among adolescents may roll into um, contraceptive indication as the patient's age. I would, with regards to the just previous question about the adding by mouth, if this is, um, if it's, uh, if this delays uh, the um, availability of this product, I do think the imperative for um, a, an oral contraceptive that's available um, is now, and I would um, encourage us to keep that in mind. And with regards to adherence, and I, I will I wrap up very close, very shortly, um, the adherence in the prescription setting among women and adolescents already is um, highly imperfect. Um, I do think that the, what's been presented um, to us does show that adolescents um, can adhere to um, daily contraceptive use in the um, access trial. And non-adherent daily dosing is likely to compromise effectiveness, but it's unlikely to pose harm greater than non-use. So, in sum, I believe that the potential incremental benefits to this product um, with regards to safety effectively, effectiveness and um, the questions about reading the label um, are um, really less than the potential incremental benefit of access to this product. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Ravati, please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Suzanne Ravati. I spoke, I questioned yesterday about the limited literacy and low literacy group. And, and I do have to say, I'm still not very happy with the low number of participants. However, I don't think that's a reason um, to, to not move forward with this. Um, and in both the groups, adolescence and limited literacy, the comprehension of use and deselection was pretty good. And there's no clarity that the direction that any woman gets of old, young, low literacy, that they get counseling in a warm and supportive environment that facilitates questions and interaction. Uh, that would be ideal for everyone, but that often doesn't happen. And the pregnancy rate already uh, that is of, of women using prescribed oral contraceptives, that's uh, a higher rate than perfect adherence, adherence shows the compliance is not perfect already. I don't see any reason why OTC distribution would be worse in compliance. Uh, just a quick comment on D, um, concomitant products like anticonvulsant drugs. I would, I would hope that those women are seeing a doctor and under some sort of care, so that would help them, period. Uh, but I, <laughs> period, I'm dictating, but um, I, I do worry about herbs and St. John's work products like that. Um, I think that people don't understand their power. I don't know what to do about that for any drug interaction. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, we will uh, move on to Dr. Walker Harding. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Leslie Walker Harding from the University of Washington. Um, I just I wanted to um, uh, underscore Dr. Berlin's uh, very comprehensive um, list of reasons why adolescents uh, really urgently need this. Um, with seventy percent of uh, adolescent, uh, you know, reproductive age uh, women um, either having no or a lower efficacy uh, birth control methods available to them. This would dramatically increase the ability of 
kids not having unintended pregnancies. Um, and I agree, focusing on safety is real important. That whether somebody takes it uh, exactly correctly, uh, whether uh, they miss some, um, you know, that happens all the time with, um, you know, after what, over 20 years of doing this work, um, talking to an adolescent in an office for 20 minutes and then giving them a one-year prescription is really uh, probably about the same as somebody reading it on the label. Um, there's not uh, a lot of uh, counseling or any particular thing that happens with uh, oral contraceptives. And the, the amount of kids that don't have access to a, a provider is tremendous. And I would, uh, in particular around the emergency contraception, contraception that theoretical risk um, is uh, only um, valid in the sense that a kid could get emergency contraception. That's uh, very hard to access. Um, even in states where it is over the counter, it's still difficult for adolescents to uh, you know access and talk to the pharmacist to to get that um so you know i i would think that i wouldn't hold it up for that um theoretical risk uh given the the lack of access even to emergency contraception for adolescents um and then in terms of adolescent decision making um there's no evidence that adolescents uh, make poor decisions. And in fact, adolescent decision-making when researched is equal to adults when given the same information. So I wouldn't want us to have any um, feeling as though we are protecting adolescents and they might not understand. Um, it would be at the same level as anyone else um, who uh, is reading the uh, the information. And I, I would say it's it's also equally urgent for those with limited literacy to be able to have the opportunity to take uh, this medication. Um, and you know the safety profile is so good that you know. I would, you know, we would need to take every other medicine off the market, like um, Benadryl, ibuprofen, uh, Tylenol, which causes deaths, um, and people can get any amount of, of that without any uh, oversight. Um, so, and this is extremely safe, much safer than all three of those medications. Um, and uh, incorrect use still doesn't appear to have uh, problematic um, issues just like it doesn't with the prescription. So I'm very much um, in favor of both adolescents and those with limited literacy, and I would hate to see it delayed. And that's it. Uh, thank you. Um, I will now call on Dr. Berenson, um, again, trying to focus our conversation on effectiveness and safety in the adolescent and limited literacy population, and particularly adding uh, points that have not been discussed uh, thus far. Thank you, um, Abby Berenson. Um, I would like to point out that the only true contraindication for this product is active breast cancer, and adolescents don't usually have active breast cancer. That would be extremely rare. So they may be the safest population to prescribe this for. There was a point made about bone mineral density, and I did an NIH-funded study on this, and that is not related to whether it's given over-the-counter or by prescription. Adolescents are given birth control pills, and whether or not you think it affects their bone density, I don't think it matters how they access the birth control. And the last thing I would like to say is from the data presented, adolescents appear, as well as those with limited literacy, the groups that are most at risk for an unintended pregnancy due to lack of access. So that would make them a priority group for over-the-counter medication. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Roth. I have a very quick comment. The pills are called OCs, oral contraceptives. Everybody knows that oral, thanks to oral B toothbrushes, means mouth. And I think it's actually insulting to add take by mouth. When somebody seeks an oral contraceptive, they know it should be taken by mouth. I don't mind if you put it in. It's a little bit mansplaining and a little bit journalistic, I think. But I think that anybody who would seek out this product 
um, would know that this is a pill that's meant to be taken by mouth. And I really don't think that if that would hold up, that language change would hold up the release of the medication that we should um, allow that. Uh, and I think adolescents would understand that oral means taken by mouth. I will thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Everhart, please go ahead. Thank you, Sabrina Everhart. I, I do have confidence in the general public's ability to understand the importance of dosage adherence um, birth control pills have been in all forms have been around for a very long time and they do have enough popularity that I feel like their knowledge is well known. However, in regards to adolescence and literacy, um, without significantly more data on the adolescent and the limited literacy populations presented in this meeting, um, I am unsure whether or not they could comply on their own or understand concomitant use without additional guidance. Um, no, I'm referring specifically to the very young population here. Um, those old, not old enough to have an ID, um, who may be of reproductive ability and not comprehend the literature. So, and that's what this question is about. Um, and as somebody who has reproductive granddaughter, uh, at 11, it brings me pause, um, as I wouldn't feel confident sending her into uh, Walgreens to choose that for herself without having the bravery to ask a pharmacist or myself. Um, I'm not sure she can even understand the literature um, and what's written. So, um, and I also have nieces and daughters, all reproductive age. And um, I do feel that age is an important factor here in this particular question that we're referring to. So um, I wanna make that clear that um, when we're referring to adolescents and those with limited literacy, um, that I, I do have concerns in that, but I I don't want that to be the reason why this doesn't go over the counter. I would just like some considerations to be um, to be discussed in regards to that very young population. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hahn. What would you like to add? I would first like to say that I do agree um, with Caitlin Roth that um, though I made the suggestion around the language that if it were going to prevent um, the availability of this uh, prescript of uh, this medication over the counter, that would not have been my intention. So I would like to retract my comments earlier if that would delay the release. I would also like to add that I don't think anybody has mentioned this. And so I would like it to be noted in the record that the major construct here in this question is around the construct of adherence. It is very clear in the literature that adherence and the uh, ability to take medication uh, such as this kind of uh, pill is largely related to factors such as self-confidence and motivation. Adherence is most certainly predicted by confidence and motivation. So if an individual, be them an adolescent, one with limited literacy, or the general population, had enough confidence to go and get this medication over the counter, I think that we can, and self-efficacy, that we can make a safe assumption that they have the motivation. And motivation is a highly recognized predictor of adherence, uh, such that it would be more so than having an interaction with a healthcare professional who might do the prescription for them if it stayed prescribed. So I think that when we think about adherence, we need to be very clear that there are other factors such as motivation and confidence that would support adherence to this medication, not to mention the fact that the data showed that thresholds were either met or exceeded when the trial was conducted. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so to, to summarize where we are to this point, I think um, in speaking to the uh, effectiveness of the norgestrel tablet in the OTC setting, the panel uh, expresses, I think, great confidence in the effectiveness, not only in the general population of females, but also in adolescent populations and those with limited literacy um, for a, a variety of factors that we've discussed. Uh, I think in terms of risk, risk from the medication itself seems to be 
uh, we, the panel seems very comfortable with the, the limited and uh, uh, number of risks um, from the medication itself. So physical risks from taking a norgestrel uh, product on a daily basis, um, may, maybe particularly in adolescent populations that are, are overall quite healthy and less prone to the kinds of conditions that would be a contraindication such as breast cancer. Um, and in fact, um, you know, the, the benefit may far outweigh the risk for, if that were the, the sum total of the equation. Um, I think risk from unintended pregnancy because of not understanding or not adhering to a daily regimen taken very close in time each day um, may be the, the greater risk that we're discussing. Um, and I have heard a little bit of mixed opinion, uh, uh, many people expressing that it is better than what is currently available and that um, uh, it, it would not necessarily be uh, information or um, or uh, directions that would be beyond the capability of of all of these populations that we've talked about thus far. Um, maybe with the possible exception of very young adolescents, and in that case, uh, maybe some some further information or data would have been helpful to understand that uh, that that aspect of of risk for for very young adolescents. Um, so to, to wrap up, oh, uh, one other point that I wanted to make, because I've heard it in all of our conversation or several of the comments made by panelists uh, thus far, was that even looking at the more conservative analysis provided by the FDA of the data from the access study, I think there's still quite a bit of confidence in this product in the OTC space. So I just wanted to make sure that that was uh, reflected in our summary here. Uh, I'd like to turn our attention finally to that last subgroup, those who are using concomitant products um, that may interact with or reduce the efficacy of this oral contraceptive. I've heard a little bit about uh, the fact that these folks would likely be under physician care for that uh, uh, additional product or that um, uh, interacting drug, uh, maybe with the exception of some OTC um, or, uh, or supplements, which are not regulated in the same way as our traditional over-the-counter drugs. Um, so I'll just ask if there are any further comments around concomitant products. Um, and, and I will begin, so Maria Coyle, Ohio State University, um, just in saying that I know that in my practice, when I am working with patients who have conditions that require regular medications, I'm consistently screening for drug interactions, including interactions with um, over-the-counter products like uh, uh, this product would be, um, and making sure to ask about not only side effects, but also potential concerns around a loss of effectiveness. Um, and, and so making sure that patients are educated and aware of, of um, maybe the, the, the interaction with that over-the-counter oral contraception would not be any different than what I would normally do when talking with a patient with epilepsy or a patient on a statin medication for cholesterol or on a patient for high blood pressure medications, um, et cetera. So I'll just add that and then invite any other comments uh, from the panel. Yes, Dr. Shaw. Yes, thank you for bringing our attention to this item. Um, I think there was some, uh, so Pamela Shaw, uh, I think there was some discussion and concern yesterday about specifically uh, the emergency use contraception and whether or not people would be taking that and, and when, um, when taking uh, uh, this um, over-the-counter um, protection only pill. And I personally um, did not have raised concern regarding that specific con concomitant product and that it would be unlikely if people are already on, I think, uh, oral contraceptive that they would be also seeking that out and that just the overall safety profile of the medication. So for me, that did not raise additional concern. And I just wanted to add that comment. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Walker Harding. Yes. Um, there we, there we go. Um, uh, Leslie Walker Harding from University of Washington. I also just wanted to say I I, I think um, that 
I don't see any additional concern for that group. I also wanted it on a record that um, I strongly believe that an adolescent of reproductive age of any age, even early adolescence, this would be safe. I would be very concerned if there were any uh, restrictions on younger adolescents who are reproductive age and need the medication. Thank you, Dr. Berlin. Hi, thank you. This is Elise Berlin, Ohio State University Nationwide Children's Hospital. I did want to comment on this question um, in the adolescent participants in the access study. There were a higher proportion that reported concomitant use of other contraceptives, and we discussed that yesterday. But just um, my comments for the panel would be that it is um, common to prescribe um, two con contraceptive hormonal products at the same time. And um, that is generally very unharmful and can have a therapeutic effect. So uh, with regards to the concomitant multiple contraceptive, I would not have any um, clinical concerns about that. And just to echo Dr. Um, Walker Hardings that I would really um, not endorse any age restriction for this product because I, I do think this product can be used safely by even the youngest adolescents. Thank you. Uh, thank you for adding that perspective from your clinical experience uh, for, to both, uh, both you and Dr. Walker Harding. Um, I'm scanning here our roster to see if there are any additional comments around this question before we move on. Uh, Dr. Espy. Eve Espy, <clears throat> University of New Mexico. I mean, I'll just state uh, the obvious that even with a one-time provider visit, uh, patients will often, you know, begin taking other medications that 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 could potentially have interactions. Um, you know, with, with with without going back to that provider for additional guidance, and also that there are very few um, actual medications that 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 uh, that have been shown to reduce the effectiveness of uh, contraceptives to the point of recommending a different uh, medication. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right, I think we will be ready to move on to question two. Um, not seeing any further comments. All right, so once again, I'm going to read the question and ask for any clarifications or questions around the wording itself. And then we will um, open the discussion for uh, comments, uh, uh, again, trying to go sort of point by point so that we fully discuss. Um, and we will begin this question. Uh, maybe we'll go for uh, another 10 or 15 minutes and then we'll we'll take a break for lunch. So just to begin, uh, this is the discussion question, the access study use phase had improbable dosing in approximately one third of participants. If FDA were to recommend the applicant conduct another actual use study, what changes to the actual, actual use study design would the committee recommend? Uh, and considering the following, um, these subpoints: e-diary design, e-diary recall period, participant compensation structure, methods ensuring data entry instructions that are adequately comprehended, uh, incorporating a pathway allowing participants to ask a healthcare provider before deciding study drug purchase or study questions to determine timing of when they spoke to a healthcare provider during the study. Are there any questions on the question itself? On the wording? Dr. Pizarek, did you have questions on the wording of the study? I do not. Okay, seeing none, I will then open uh, the conversation for panelist discussion. And Dr. Pizarek, you may go ahead. I just have a question. Um, since there's a big deal made about when pills were taken and at what time they were taken, is there not a, a place for using like an electronic pill dispenser where you would know exactly when the pill was taken? So uh, just to summarize, it sounds like you're recommending that if this study were to be repeated, it would have some sort of a mechanism that was more objective in measuring uh, pill pill dispensing or pill uh, removal from the pill pack. Exactly. Yes, Dr. Uh, Ms. Everhart, go ahead. Thank you, Sabrina Everhart. Since uh, we don't know the actual design 
information of uh, that e-diary. Um, as far as I'm aware, that was not made available. Um, if, if it is available, I would like to see it. Um, uh, but I would recommend maybe revising that over reporting um, and it's alert, um, given what little information I've been given on that, um, possibly for the future studies as well, um, anything post-marketing. Also, I, I would advise maybe to include in that e-diary, um, if this is possible, the ability to maybe virtually speak to a nurse, um, whether it's video or chat, if they so desired um, by the participant to be able to ask questions, specifically if they can't get back to the study site or can't contact their own doctor. Um, and, and maybe that might help um, with some a little bit of data input. So those are really my only recommendations based on what I've seen so far. Thank you. So Ms. Everhart, are you saying that in terms of the e-diary design and use, having a, a resource to check in on, um, use of the diary itself would be helpful? Or are you speaking absolutely. more to a later point? Yes, absolutely. Um, if this study were to be redone, um, the ability to in-app in um, chat, um, specifically even with the medical uh, personnel would, well, I think would be much, uh, would be helpful for them to be able to contact support on the app itself as the, this generation is frequently well versed in how to use that method of communication more so than others. So it sounds like you're suggesting that both in terms of the, the use of the diary itself or how to, how to track information in the e-diary might be useful to have a uh, sort of a, a chat function or a live support, uh, but also maybe for uh, one of the later points there about uh, accessing healthcare providers. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Catlin, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, Jesse Catlin, Cal State uh, University, Sacramento. Um, just quickly related to the last comment um, by Dr. Everhart, my, I did find, I think it's the FDA presentation, slide 123, um, had a lot of added some clarity for me on how the diary was actually designed. Um, one of the things, I mean, I, I definitely understand the sponsor's perspective and the FDA's uh, you know, concerns about the study. Um, as someone who does a lot of consumer behavior research, I think it's helpful maybe that we consider the extreme. So, you know, if we did another study, we could design a trial with a daily reminder that give, makes them enter the data every day, doesn't allow any reporting when they don't have any pills. Um, and this would obviously yield a study with no missing data and no over-reporting. Um, but of course, then, you know, we could design the study, but would we believe the data? Would it really represent actual use? Um, so I, I would ask us to consider that, you know, we, we probably could request a study that goes the other way, um, but would it yield, you know, we'd be having a different conversation now of whether it represents actual use. So um, I think, you know, now we're having a conversation that maybe the, the study couldn't, wasn't necessarily restrictive enough, which led to some, you know, messy data and some problems. Um, but I think if, if we have things like a chat feature, if we did other stuff like that, does it actually represent how the consumer is going to use the product um, when they're when they're left to their own devices? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Catlin. That's very helpful. Um, Dr. Horn, would you like to say something? Would you like to add to the conversation? Thank you. Yes, Dr. Coyle. Um, I just wanted to respond um, to the comment about um, where the study design um, information is located. So thank you, Dr. Catlin, for pointing out where it is in the slides. Um, in the background document, FDA background document, um, study design description starts on uh, page 44 and, um, and goes on from there and includes some information about the e-diary design. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Dr. Walker-Harding, um, anything that you would like to add about the e-diary in particular? Hi, Leslie Walker-Harding, University of Washington. No, I was um, going more generally to the question at hand. Um, and um, I, I just, you know, the question itself to me is concerning if um, there was a recommendation to do another study. Um, I very much agree with uh, Dr. Uh, Caitlin, who just spoke. I, and 
I'm not sure what would that do. We already know the safety profile. Um, what would we be doing? Trying to have a, a better actual study with, um, again, information that might not even approximate the real world. Um, any of these studies are going to be imperfect. Um, we're trying to look at real use. And uh, any amount of delay during a time when people have less access to primary care providers post-pandemic than they ever have is really, in, in a way, causing further harm to um, adolescents and others who don't have access to these medications, which could help them prevent a unwanted pregnancy. So I would say that I would really be uh, not interested in seeing another actual use study on uh, something like this, where we know the safety profile is so uh, great to begin with. Thank you. Um, Dr. Uh, Arm, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Curtis, I apologize. Let me back up. I, I've misread my roster. It's Dr. Armstrong next and then Dr. Curtis. Yes, Deb Armstrong from Johns Hopkins. Two issues. The first is that I know you're not asking us this in this question, but I think uh, you, you've been hearing that most of it, if there was another actual use study, would not want that to be um, a barrier to um, uh, actually having the um, the drug available. That that shouldn't delay that 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 shouldn't delay um, um, access to the drug if that's the that's the ultimate decision. That 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 there shouldn't be a delay based on this. Uh, that said, another actual use study. Uh, you know, I I um, I really champion what Dr. Everhart said, which is that if you could, if there could be included, you know, um, a like a contact for questions. I would also strongly encourage whether another actual use study is done or not that a video that basically says everything that's in the written comments that individuals can access at any time. You know, YouTube type of video. That um, it could be done in different. It could address li the literacy issue. It could address uh, the adolescent compliance issue. Um, it you, it could be done in different languages. Um, and I think in, for you know modern day young individuals in particular, you know, seeing a video is worth you know ten small print written directions. Um, so I think first. So again, I would not think that I, I would be opposed to an actual use study that delayed. Um, uh, availability of this, but if it were done, I think that that those two things, uh, a contact um, information line or person and a video to address uh, and um, uh, question the, the recommendations in the small print um, would be very helpful. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to um, allow Dr. Curtis to speak next, but just with the caveat, we're going to do one more question and then we'll take a break for lunch and we'll reconvene after lunch with Dr. Horn um, and, and then um, uh, and then we will uh, uh, wrap up the conversation around question number two. Sorry, trying to manage a few ma moving parts here, but um, Dr. Curtis will let you speak and then we'll we'll break for lunch. Right, I'll be quick. Thank you, Kate Curtis, CDC. I just wanted to say that the improbable dosing issue um, is important and I don't think it's been adequately addressed and certainly leads to some uncertainty in the findings. Um, but I, despite this, I would not recommend another actual use study at this time. And I think we can make a decision on the totality of the evidence. Thank you. So to summarize where we are at this point in discussion question number two, it sounds like there's a strong recommendation from the panelists who have spoken thus far uh, to not necessarily investigate or to go down the path of, a, of an additional actual use study, which I realize is outside the, the scope of what we've been asked to specifically address. Um, but, but that is something that has come through. Um, I, there may be some recommendations for improvement and we will focus on that aspect of this discussion question when we reconvene after lunch. Um, we will take a break for 30 minutes. So we will plan to start again at 1230 which I acknowledge is a short break, but in the um, interest of ending as close to on time as possible, I'm going to suggest that we break for 30 minutes with panelists uh, re-logging uh, in again at about 12.20, 12.25 to be sure that we can start promptly at 12.30. Um, 
And then just as a final reminder, there should be no chatting or discussion of these meeting topics or questions with other panel members during the lunch break. Uh, and uh, I, I will see you all at 1230. Thank you so much.
Hope you had a, a, a nice break and we will now reconvene our uh, meeting. I would like to return our attention to uh, discussion question number two and I will first call on Dr. Horn um, to address the uh, panel. Well, um, this is Pamela Horn, DNPD2. I'm going to um, pass it over to Dr. Murray. Hi, Karen Murray, Deputy Director, Office of Non-Prescription Drugs. And I'd like to thank the panel for a very, very thoughtful discussion so far. I wanted to mention a couple of things that were relevant to um, some comments that were made. First of all, there was one suggestion um, that a nurse could be involved somehow, either in a redesigned um, actual use trial or in the <laughs> eventual use of the product. And I just want to remind the panel that the legal definition of a non-prescription drug in the United States is that there is no healthcare professional involved and nurses are definitely highly trained healthcare professionals. So a drug that needed the involvement of a nurse would not be a non-prescription drug. Uh, and then there was another suggestion that perhaps a video could be used. And um, if, uh, if the panel is suggesting that a video or some type of technology element would be something that would be needed in order to get past some of the difficulties that the application is facing, then that would be, uh, that would probably fall under our uh, paradigm of an additional condition for non-prescription use for which the agency recently put out a proposed rule and the applicant would need to um, propose that additional condition for non-prescription use and do uh, consumer behavior testing to show that again, um, consumers would use the drug correctly, safely and effectively in the non-prescription environment. So um, while those are um, um, creative and innovative potential approaches to overcoming the problem, one of them is not consistent with non-prescription law in the United States, and the other one would uh, require um, uh, that the applicant uh, go back to the drawing board on their development program and submit another application. Thank you. Um, and we always appreciate those um, helpful guidances from the FDA just to remind us of the lane that we are, um, uh, are in when we're considering over-the-counter medications. So I appreciate that. Um, I will go back to the hands that were raised in the order that they were available to us uh, before our break. But before doing so, I just want to acknowledge that we've heard from several panelists that they are not proposing, uh, they are not in favor uh, of redoing or asking the FDA to redo um, an actual use study with the applicant. Um, so I think that message has been captured and has been delivered to the FDA. So I would like the panel to truly consider what the question itself is asking. Uh, and that would be what improvements could be made to an actual use study um, method that might actually address some of the concerns that were raised with the data that was presented. So not, not to minimize the importance of the other message, but also you know, just to use our time wisely and make sure that the FDA does end up with the information that they are needing from our expertise here uh, as we are assembled today. So I will um, ask Dr. Hahn to begin. Hi, my name is Dr. Jolie Hahn and I am representing uh, James A. Bailey Veterans Hospital and the University of Utah um, with the acknowledgement that I do not support um, the recommendation of another trial. I do think that there is something that has actually not been discussed, uh, nor is it listed on this design um, option uh inquiries from A through F, which is the addition of qualitative inquiry with potential patient and or user consumer participants to not only engage some of the questions that have come up around um, the over-reporting, um, but also 
preferences for use, as well as needs along, along the different topics that are addressed here, such as the pathway, as well as um, the idea around timing at which participants would like to be able to engage in the process. So there has been little to no mention of qualitative inquiry. So I do believe that mixed methodologies are always a um, superior design, and I have heard of no uh, qualitative inquiry. And I do think it would also speak to consumer demand for an OTC uh, uh, application of this medication. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Han. Dr. Shaw, what would you like to share? Hi, thank you, P Pamela Shaw. Um, I'd just like to respond to the question about if this were of interest to the FDA, what kind of design recommendations would there be? And I'd like to emphasize what Dr. Caitlin said, which is um, you don't want to put in uh, aspects of this study that artificially increase adherence. You know, and I have concerns about that reminder that happened every four days. And this is supposed to be measuring actual use. And so um, to the best uh, that it's possible, looking at other studies that have used e-diary uh, to encourage um, this, that participants fill out a study instrument, that participants need to remember the protocol for the study they're in. Those sorts of reminders can be helpful, but not you know, this is not a study about increasing adherence. And so I had some concerns about the reminders were messing up the message. Um, I also had concerns that the device, the e-diary e uh, technology perhaps was not properly tested. It's a little bit, of, I think, of the Wild West sometimes in the app world. And so I would like to see if this were of interest to the FDA, that um, there would be a proper pilot that would test the diary in the manner it would be intended to be used to, to catch any weird flaws that seem to compromise the interpretation of previous studies and even completely invalidate, I think it was the option study where the e-diary had a total failure. So I feel like maybe um, pilot is a very important aspect and even perhaps the credentials of the vendor and past use of an instrument, all instruments in a study before they're launched on hundreds or thousands of people hopefully are being properly tested. Um, those are my main comments. Thank you. Oh, and one, I'm sorry, one last thing was the last question F. If actual use interest is in whether or not a participant contacted the healthcare provider before or after starting, if that is of, use, of interest in an actual use study, then that question should be asked. Um, that's my final comment, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, Dr. Bauer, um, and it, in particular, uh, I would also invite others um, who have not yet spoken to get in line so that we could wrap this question up, um, particularly around items maybe C, D, and E, which we have not really discussed um, in great detail yet. Uh, or I'm sorry, B, C, and D, which we have not discussed in great detail. Dr. Bauer, you can go ahead. Yes, yeah, Cynthia Bauer, University of Maryland. I would just add to the list the actual stimulus itself, which as the FDA keeps reminding us is the um, label and any other consumer information, because that is part of what goes into the decision-making and the consumer behavior. So I would just make sure that any consumer information that was included in any trial was on this list as part of any consideration for changes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Barron. Um, just to contribute a little bit to specifically to letter D in methods ensuring e-dire data entry instructions or adequately comprehended. One of the things that we have uh, always done is a teach back mechanism. And I'm not sure if that was done. And if it was, I'm sorry, I'm Monday morning quarterbacking here. But the teach back is one of the ways at the screening, during the screening or that point in time in which instructions are given, we always make sure that the teach back um, is performed um, to ensure that they didn't understand. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Shaw, did you have another comment? No, Pamela Shaw, failure to lower hand. Thank you. Thank you. Acknowledged and forgiven. <laughs> um, uh, so Maria Coyle from Ohio State University, I will add one comment um, about the participant compensation structure. Um, I understand that there is some concern that in the, um, in the access study, uh, payment was linked to uh, frequency of reporting or frequency of, of adherence um, entries into the diary. And it does seem like 
perhaps there might be some alternative ways to reward um, or or in, incentivize um, attention to the diary that are not uh, connected directly to number of entries. Uh, so perhaps there's other ways to look at milestones. And again, looking at other um, studies that maybe have done this successfully to just consider um, alternatives would be worthwhile. Are there any final comments from any of our panelists regarding this, this study question? And while I wait to, to do that scan of our um, of our members, I will just attempt to summarize that uh, again, the, the panelists had a strong preference not um, to endorse a, a repeat actual use study um, or ask the FDA to do that, uh, which was beyond really the scope of this question, but was expressed sincerely and frequently. And so I feel like it's important to reiterate that. Um, I think there are some elements of the um, uh, of the study design around the, the e-diary, uh, particularly maybe piloting a, a tool that would uh, address some of the uncertainties that we're seeing in the existing study, um, maybe reevaluating uh, how best to compensate participants that's not uh, required on number of entries uh, directly, and um, uh, other ways to both inform use of the platform, but also um, uh, to help uh, participants uh, in asking for help when needed around use of the product or use of the e-diary itself. I also want to acknowledge the uh, comment that Dr. Um, Catlin had made uh, and that was also supported by many of our panelists that um, it, it is a very delicate balance in, in having a, a sufficient control to fully understand the results, but also not so much that you really interfere with the, uh, the simulation of a, of a real world environment. So I think the panel acknowledges those challenges and, uh, uh, you know, just would, would, uh, would again, not necessarily favor being too restrictive or too controlling um, in the study design itself. Not seeing uh, other comments or uh, others wishing to speak, I'm gonna move on to, to our discussion question number three. So this question asks the panel to discuss um, whether there's sufficient information to conclude consumers in the following scenarios will appropriately deselect from norgestrel use. So consumers with a history or current diagnosis of breast cancer, Consumers with abnormal vaginal bleeding of undiagnosed etiology, consumers who are using other hormonal contraceptives. So I will begin by just asking the panel to first identify if there's any questions around the wording or language that needs to be clarified. And we'll pause for just a moment. Seeing none, I will... Um, now open the floor for discussion. Dr. Barron, Barron please go ahead. Um, Alma Barron. Um, I think for letter A, for consumers with a history of or current diagnosis of breast cancer, um, we've heard that this is really the one contraindication. Um, and um, I think I was uh, reassured yesterday when Dr. Goodwin stated that the attitude of breast cancer patients, and of course, I'm not an oncologist, um, the attitude of breast cancer patients is such that the, they are so preoccupied with not getting breast cancer again. And so um, it they will not be careless about taking anything that will uh, cause a recurrence of the breast cancer. So I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Armstrong, um, please share your comments, uh, particularly if they're focused on that sub-bullet A around the history of or diagnosis of breast cancer. Yeah, just uh, thank you. This is Deb Armstrong. Uh, I just would echo uh, what uh, I think it was Dr. Barron just said, which is that um, that women with breast cancer sh should or, or almost always are under the care of an oncologist. And avoiding hormonal factors, even in women with hormone receptor negative breast cancer is something that we really uh, target. Um, and I would think that any woman who had breast cancer diagnosis in the past or has currently active breast cancer would be highly aware of that. So I, I don't think that's um, 
uh, but um, I, I don't think that's going to be a concern. Um, since I'm on, I would just sort of ask with the, uh, the bullet point B, if any of the um, gynecologists uh, can talk about, you know, what what's abnormal vaginal bleeding, particularly in a um, in an adolescent girl. Um, uh, sometimes what's we call abnormal might not be might actually not be all that abnormal uh, during adolescence. Dr. SP, do you have a response for Dr. Armstrong's question? Yes, I do. Eve SP, <clears throat> University of New Mexico. I mean, that's a really good question. I think the major concern about abnormal uh, vaginal bleeding of undiagnosed etiology is the concern about cancer, either cervical cancer um, or uh, uterine cancer, both of which are you know, extraordinarily rare in uh, certainly in young people. But even in um, even in, in older women, uh, it, it is unusual to have um, to, to have bleeding that is, you know, th th that that would be uh, made worse by um, by taking the medication. So, I mean, the concern is, do you delay diagnosis? Somebody who's got uh, unscheduled bleeding, irregular bleeding between periods, who might have endometrial hyperplasia, you know, thickening of the lining of the uterus, or a uterine cancer, um, be, because the the patient is taking the uh, this birth control pill. That would be an unusual scenario. Um, the, and the, the medication that we typically use to treat, uh, hyperplasia is, uh, is progestin. Um, so, uh, and I'm not saying that, you know, th that it, it, it's an appropriate use of the medication to, you know, utilize it in the absence of an actual diagnosis of, uh, endometrial hyperplasia. Um, but but I think that 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 the the safety concern about missing patients with um, with this unexplained vaginal bleeding uh, that actually have an endometrial cancer is very very low. Um, abnormal vaginal bleeding, as was mentioned by this by I think both the sponsor and the FDA, uh, is one of the most frequent reasons for visits by patients to you know to um, to to women's healthcare providers. Uh, and uh, typically, particularly in young people, is 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 normal um, or at least not dangerous. Thank you, Dr. Afsi. Um, so I think thus far we've heard um, from some of several of our panelists regarding sort of the information provided from clinical experience and their own training. Um, I think that the specific discussion question probably is intended to capture that, but also uh, information from the, the applicant's um, packet, uh, the, the data from the, the actual use study and the access study, um, it, and the you know, analysis, additional analysis completed by the FDA. So if, if there are any um, individuals on our panel who would like to speak to their, their interpretation of that data and whether the information contained therein is enough, um, either by itself or with clinical, um, you know, expertise added in to to further, um, you know, sort of bring us to closure on this question. I would invite those now, especially anyone who maybe um, has not uh, spoken or has thoughts that have not been shared. Um, So specifically, this really goes back to that self-selection question that was um, being, you know, addressed in the application. So we would invite your thoughts on that. And and I can begin. I, Maria Coyle, I spent a, a few minutes this morning, sort of looking at the side by side between the FDA interpretation of the uh, access data and then the the sponsors' interpretation, and I think. For me, it was reassuring to have that that reanalysis and to look at some of those sensitivity analyses and 
Um, I felt that that information, um, although uh, viewed through a slightly different lens, was was overall quite confirmatory that um, that patients who do not really meet criteria for for OTC use of the norgestrel were largely not using it um, to to quite a great quite a large extent. Maybe with the possible exception of limited literacy, where we don't necessarily know enough to draw conclusions. Uh, so by my read, I was fairly comfortable, especially given that there were multiple um, viewpoints represented. Dr. Hahn. Thank you. Um, I would like to echo your sentiments. Um, I do think that the deselection data that was presented by the access trial team was compelling and supports uh, that consumers with out or with contraindications would not use the over the counter pill. Um, I could be mistaken on my recall. So I invite others to correct me, but I believe what I, and, and if somebody um, has the ability to put up the slide that would be very helpful. But as I recall, there were figures and I think maybe a table that presented that data that indicated that those thresholds for deselection were met. I don't know if we can show those to the committee again. I was trying to find it in the slide deck uh, while you were speaking, Dr. Coyle, and I was unable to find it myself. But if anyone else could present that slide, I think it might be helpful to the committee. I believe there was actually one based on limited literacy. Uh, I believe there may have been one on adol for adolescents and possibly even though it was a smaller, it was uh, this, the adolescents, I believe, had the smaller sample, but I do believe that was made available to us for viewing. Yes, Dr. Horn, go ahead. That out. We're going to try to pull up the slides as Pamela Horn, um, DNPD2. Um, we're just looking for. Thank you. Number. Can you uh, bring us to uh, slide 105 of the um, FDA presentation? We'll turn it back to the committee to continue discussing if this is um, the slide that uh, Dr. Hahn wanted. Dr. Horn, I think we're having a little bit of trouble hearing you here. I don't know if you could repeat that. Um, 
This is the slide that we think Dr. Han was referring to. Um, can you just confirm and, and please continue to your discussion if this is what you were looking for? So I recall that there was a very, I recall that there was, this is Dr. Jolie Hahn with uh, James A. Haley, Veterans Hospital and University of Utah. I recall that they, uh, the, the slide that you showed before this one showed that the th thresholds were exceeded for those with limited literacy. And I don't know if the other committee members saw that, but it was presented though briefly um, before this slide. And then as I recall, this was a very uh, low, uh, small sample size, but it did give an indication of the data available. I think that based on what I'm seeing here, this sample size is uh, challenging for us to make any conclusive statements. But as uh, one of our oncologists and colleagues mentioned previously, this is going to be a very rare event um, that women with breast cancer history uh, would allow themselves to be um, without clinical advice based on their cancer diagnosis, opposed to needing um, a physician to promote or contraindicate the use of the birth control pill. And then I believe that this data that's now um, presented on the slide provides uh, conclusive, conclusive and ample evidence that uh, give us the ability to indicate that individuals that are adolescents and or have low health literacy would deselect from the use. Thank you. Sponsor, uh, w would you like to respond to that at all? I believe I saw your hand up. Yes, uh, we just wanted to uh, show the slide that we believe was being requested. So you're you're comfortable with the slide now that's been shared. Yes, thank okay, you. Thank you. And FDA, can I clarify the slide that was up previously? So this question is for FDA. Um, the, the slide that you had put up previously, that was um, information that was really relevant to a previous version of the drug fact label. So some adjustment has already been made in, in response to that. Pamela Horn, DNPD2. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, we can't hear you, out. Dr. Horn. So oh, sorry. Um, this is Pamela Horn, DNPD2. I'm going to let um, Barbara Cohen respond to that clarifying question. This is Barbara Cohen, FDA. Correct. The previous, the, ver the label version that was used in the access study said do not use if you have any cancer, and the current label says uh, do not use if you have or ever had breast cancer, and then ask a doctor before use if you had any cancer. Thank you. I appreciate that clarification. Uh, Dr. Berlin? Hi, Elise Berlin, Ohio State University Nationwide Children's Hospital. Just to comment on uh, your request for thoughts on um, the question in B, which is I'm looking at the FDA slide 175 around um, self-selection for abnormal vaginal bleeding. And to me, there they found 34 participants reported uh, unexplained vaginal bleeding before use. And this is the FDA slide. 27% did not report speaking to, speaking to a healthcare provider, but it's, the flip of that to me is 72% did report speaking to a healthcare provider. And to me, I am, I am reassured about this and I don't have additional concerns. Um, and then I've already spoken around concomitant use of hormonal contraceptives, um, I think being uh, clinically acceptable. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other comments from the panel um, regarding this uh, discussion question? I'm doing a scan of our virtual room here to be sure I have not uh, failed to recognize anyone. Uh, Dr. Shaw. 
it, this is just a quick clarification, Pamela Shaw, um, with regards to the uh, label around vaginal bleeding. Um, there, there were, um, you know, it's version H that's now being proposed in the submission. But um, I just wanted clarity that, that those changes included changes around vaginal bleeding. Had that was that tested in any of the those changes in H versus G, which was done in the self the targeted selection study, were those changes evaluated, or they're just newly submitted? Dr. Horn, could you address that? This is Pamela Horn, um, DNPD two. I'm going to um, ask Barbara Cohen to respond. This is Barbara Cohen. Yes, the change was evaluated. All right, thank you very much for that, clarifying my question. Thanks. I don't see any further uh, panelists who uh, uh, are requesting input. So I will do a brief summary and then we'll let Dr. Horn um, uh, speak and, and perhaps close us out here. Uh, so what I've heard is that in addition to just sort of clinical experience providing reassurance, the, the data as presented by either the sponsor uh, uh, and the FDA, I guess presented from both perspectives, um, it seemed overall to be quite reassuring to panelists in that consumers with a history uh, or diagnosis of breast cancer were not likely to be inadvertently or incorrectly selecting to take the, the uh, norgestrol. And uh, more likely was a scenario where a consumer might have abnormal vaginal bleeding. Um, and, and in that case, there was less concern given the data that was presented. Uh, Dr. Horn, what would you like to add to this before we wrap up uh, these discussion questions? Thank you, Dr. Coyle. I'm going to pass it to Dr. Murray. Thank you, Karen Murray, Deputy Director, Office of Non-Prescription Drugs. Um, I just want to, first of all, thank the panel for all of their extremely useful input. And I just want to emphasize from the FDA that we really realize how important it is that uh, U.S. women have increased access to effective contraception, and I don't want um, I don't want um, any of our discussion or our pointing out of the deficiencies of the development program to take away from that message. Um, we realize that it is extremely important, um, and we thank the panel for their many comments that had to do with their experience apart from their interpretation of what the study showed. We do want to point out, though, that um, when a development program is proposed for a non-prescription drug, we can't just approve it based on the experience in the prescription setting without the applicant doing adequate studies to look at what's likely to happen in the non-prescription setting. And it would have been um, a much easier time for the agency if the applicant had submitted um, a development program and an actual use study that um, was very easy to interpret and did not have so many challenges. Um, but that was not what happened for us. And so the FDA has been put in a very difficult position of trying to determine whether it is likely that women will use this product safely and effectively in the non-prescription setting. But I wanted to, again, emphasize that FDA does realize how very important women's health is and how important it is to try to increase access to effective contraception for U.S. women. And I'll close with that. Thank you. Uh Ms. Rossetti, would you like to make a comment? I apologize. Ms. Ferrati, would you like to make a comment?
Ms. Rabadi, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm afraid we can't hear you. We're, we seem to have some connection difficulties with your audio. Ms. Rorati, would you like to try again? Oh, I'm sorry, it's still it's still not coming through. I apologize, but we we aren't able to hear your comment. So I, I'm afraid, Ms. Rabadi, I'm afraid we can't understand anything that's coming through your audio. So we'll have to move on. I'm afraid you're having connection issues. I'm so sorry. Yes, can you can you hear me? Can you hear me? We are not able to hear you. I'm sorry. Hi. Can you, can you not hear me? So unfortunately, we're going to have to move on with the agenda due to that connection can issue. We're not able to recognize. Um, or understand what Ms. Rabadi is, is sharing. So at this point, I would like to just sort of summarize and take a look back at these three discussion questions. Um, I think uh, overall the panel uh, is in favor of the norgesterol tablet being used in a safe and effective manner in um, both the general population and some subpopulations uh, based on the information presented by FDA and the sponsor. Um, as well as uh, a more broad um, clinical experience. Uh, the, the panel was not in favor particularly of conducting another actual use study, but did have some recommendations um, around perhaps improving the methodology, particularly piloting use of an e-diary platform or an app um, that might be more sufficient to the needs of, of answering the study questions um, and for, possibly providing some support to users of that platform during the, um, uh, the study period. And then um, feeling comfortable with the information presented uh, around deselection for those who may be inappropriate users of the norgestrol, uh, particularly around the diagnosis or history of breast cancer or vaginal bleeding, uh, although that perhaps is more skewed by um, clinical experience rather than the data itself, um, but but we did talk about both. Um, can I ask, Dr. Horn, did did we address these questions sufficiently for for FDA, or are there um, additional conversations or questions that you would like to to pose for our consideration before we move on to the vote? This is Pamela Horn, DNPD two. Um, yes. Uh, the discussion was adequate, and thank you all for your contributions. Thank, thank you um, as well. And, and just in summary, I guess I would also like to say I appreciate the, the challenge presented um, by, by this application, uh, both the uh, urgent need for, for access to, to oral contraceptives, uh, not limited only to prescription access, but also, um, you know, being, being um, true to the process that has served um, served us well in the United States with, with OTC medications for, for these many, many years. So I just appreciate that position and the due diligence that everyone has shown in answering our questions here on the panel um, and also um, the, the efforts of the public speakers uh, yesterday. Truly a kind of a remarkable discussion uh, in my experience. So at this point, we're gonna move on uh, to the next question, which is a voting question. And Dr. Moonhee Choi will provide the instructions for voting. Question four is a voting question. If you are not a voting participant, you will be moved to a breakout room. Voting members will use the Zoom platform to submit their vote for this meeting. After the chairperson has read the voting question into the record, 
and all questions and discussions regarding the wording of the vote question are complete, the, the chairperson will, chair will announce that voting will begin. A voting display will appear where you can submit your vote. There will be no discussion during the voting session. You will select the radio button, that is the round circular button in the window that corresponds to your vote. Yes, no, or abstain. Please note that once you click the submit button, you will not be able to change your vote. Once all voting members have selected their vote, I will announce that the vote is closed. Please note that there will be a momentary pause as we tally the vote results and return non-voting members into the meeting room. Next, the vote results will be displayed on the screen. I will read the vote results from the screen into the record. Thereafter, the chairperson will go down the list and each voting member will state their name and their vote into the record. You can also state the reason why, why you voted as you did if you want to. However, should, uh, you should also address any subparts of the voting question, if any. Are there any questions about the voting process before we begin? Thank you. Dr. Troy, are we ready to proceed? Is everyone in the breakout? I will now begin opening the breakout rooms.
has closed and is now complete. After I read the vote results into the record, the chairperson will go down the list and each voting member will state their name and their vote into the record. You can also state the reason why you voted as, as you did um, if, if you want to. However, you should also address any subparts of the voting question, if any. For the record, we have 17 yes, zero no, and zero abstentions. Thank you. We will now go down the list and have everyone who voted state their name and vote into the record. You may also provide justification of your vote if you wish to. And in fact, in this case, I would recommend that we do ask each individual to provide their own reasoning for the vote and not to simply default to other uh, reasons that have been given previously. So for example, please do make sure that each individual you stay why you, why you voted as you did and give the specific reasoning so that we may fully understand the rationale behind this vote. We'll start with Dr. Armstrong. Dr. Armstrong. Thank you. Um, I voted yes. Um, I feel that um, the, the risks of um, uh, unintended pregnancy is lower with this uh, uh, approach than any of the other um, available contraceptive approaches that um, that our uh, uh, women have access to without um, seeing a healthcare provider. Um, I believe that uh, the contraindication to use issues, um, I think, will be well understood. Um, and um, uh, and th that thus, um, I voted yes. I would also just like to say that uh, um, listening to the eloquent and intelligent, uh, informed and passionate individuals who are mostly young and mostly women who presented at the open public hearing uh, restores my faith in the future. Thank you. Dr. Curtis. Hey, Curtis, CDC, I voted yes. Um, and I voted yes because the evidence demonstrates that the benefits clearly exceed the risks. Um, the benefits of moving oak pill over the counter include increased access to contraception, especially those who face multiple barriers that we heard about yesterday, reduction in unintended pregnancy and associated risks, and improved reproductive autonomy and improved equity equitable access to contraception, which we also heard about so passionately yesterday. So for all of these reasons, I think OPIL has the potential to have a huge positive public health impact. Um, with respect to risks um, for safety, safety was established 50 years ago when the original um, approval was made and the accumulating body of evidence since then um, has shown that these pills are safe with very few contraindications and long-term safety concerns. Um, with effectiveness, effectiveness was also um, established 50 years ago. And while the methods for um, assessing effectiveness and the population characteristics have changed over the years, um, all of the estimates that we heard about over the last two days fall somewhere between two and four per hundred. Um, which is much lower than any of the other over-the-counter products um, and, and lower than the generally accepted typical use failure rate of seven for oral contraceptives um, received in the prescription setting. Um, so the large body of evidence on the safety and effectiveness is very reassuring. Um, the data presented over the last two days from the applicant on comprehension of the label and actual use were also generally reassuring, um, even with the, the problems with the data. Um, and even for the subgroups of younger adolescents and those with um, lower literacy, those were the two groups that did sometimes have some of the lower scores. Um, even for these groups, the risk of harm is low and the potential for a benefit is high. Um, and so that's why I believe that the evidence demonstrates that the, the benefits exceed the risks. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Barron. Alma Barron, I voted yes. Um, I believe first um, in um, when we were asked to serve in this panel, we were asked to um, scrutinize the evidence, the data that was presented um, in this um, study, in this trial, um, and to take into consideration the risks and benefits of having this, um, avail this medication available as an uh, over-the-counter pill. And so um, I'd like to speak to the study first. My, um, 
My concerns, uh, number one, regarding the breast cancer patient who failed to deselect was, uh, was what was most bothersome to me initially. And um, I, as I've mentioned earlier, I think I have been reassured that this is not normal behavior of the breast cancer population. Number two concern that I had was the low representation of the, uh, the low literacy um, population. And um, I think the explanation that the realm, um, the realm method, the, the realm assessment method could um, under detect um, the low literacy uh, population. And so there might actually be more than 14% um, that's represented in the study. So that is reassuring to me. Um, and then uh, I still have uh, questions like most people about the uh, improbable dosing. But again, as a healthcare provider who lives weighing risks ben versus benefits on a daily basis, I do think that the ben in this situation, the benefits outweigh the risks. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Everhart. Sabrina Everhart, patient representative. Thank you to the FDA for the opportunity to be part of this historical review. Um, I did vote yes with um, adolescent recommendations. I agree that the efficacy of the safety profile has definitely withstood the test of time and that the DFL is appropriate for over-the-counter. Um, I understand the need for more options and access to reproductive health. Um, I believe the, the population would benefit from this product over-the-counter and could safely self-select. Um, however, I would like to say that I am reserved about the data on the adolescent and limited literacy population and their ability to properly make medical choices for this product for themselves uh, without guidance outside of the DFL leaflet. If FDA does not approve this over-the-counter for these reasons, it could be a reason to consider uh, behind-the-counter availability. Also, with respect to public speaker number 35, and I'm sorry, I missed her name. She was a pharmacist. Um, I appreciated her input um, and uh, her input on the pharmacy role here. As I had a lot of questions regarding that particular pro topic that was answered, um, so I thank you for that. Um, a recommendation could be uh, maybe a public awareness campaign by the sponsor designed specifically for the adolescent population um, that falls within the <laughs> over-the-counter uh, regulations. So. Thank you to the FDA for clarifying those regulations. And, and finally, I'd like to thank the public for their comments as it's an important part of my decision process here as a patient representative. Um, I feel like the lack of adolescent and limited literacy studies was my struggle here today, um, but you also urged us to follow the science. Thus, based on that data presented yesterday and today, my recommendation stands of over-the-counter approval with considerations for young adolescents or possible third class considerations if denied by the FDA. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Roth. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be on this panel. Um, I uh, agree with uh, almost everything that everyone else has said. And so I'm gonna try not to repeat it too much, uh, but, uh, I think the safety profile of oral contraceptives since their inception and of the progesterone only pills were very well established. And so I think that the public will be well served from a safety perspective. Um, the risks um, to women um, of an unintended pregnancy and um, are much greater than any of the things we were discussing as risks of putting this pill out, out over the counter. Um, the history of women's contraception is a struggle for women's control over their reproduction. And we need to trust women. I think that the speakers yesterday, especially the younger speakers, really brought home to all of us uh, how much more we have to do to repair our broken health system and how poor 
Lee, we have made access um, to health care available for so many young women, adolescents, older women. And uh, to the extent that approving this pill to be available over the counter will go toward rectifying that, uh, I think it's a, a, a very important move. So thank you very much. And I think that I urge the FDA to... Um, approve the over-the-counter availability of OPIL. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roth. And, and can you just restate your vote for the record as well? Oh, sorry, I voted yes. Thank you. In favor of um, OPIL's application to um, have uh, over-the-counter permission to uh, sell their drug. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Espy. Thank you. Also really appreciate the opportunity to be on the panel. Eve Espy, University of New Mexico. Um, I voted yes. I do believe there's adequate information, both from the sponsors um, and from uh, prior evidence that consumers can use Norgestrel safely and effectively. Um, understanding the methodological concerns, I, I do believe the sponsors have shown that the single absolute contraindication was well understood. Um, and the, the track record of safety of POPs um, for the 30 years that it was on the market um, is, is well established. It, it would therefore, I think, take a very high bar of concern to justify non-approval of over-the-counter status, um, you know, given what we know about, about this medication. Um, I, I also was very moved by the testimony of the, the, the public um, and agree with the strong endorsements of our, our major professional organizations. My personal experience practicing in a large rural state, uh, New Mexico, over the last 30 years, I mean, I see it firsthand, you know, people who face all of these barriers um, and who also uh, experience the, the maternal morbidity and mortality that goes along with unintended pregnancy that I think was really um, eloquently uh, expressed by Dr. Glazier and, and which is highly relevant to this uh, conversation. So from my perspective, despite the FDA concerns about the study design and differing interpretations of the studies, um, the overall very uh, rare and unlikely harms are outweighed by the tremendous benefits of improved access without uh, any restrictions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Berenson. I voted yes. Um, I felt that both sides did an excellent job of presenting the data and the studies and certainly gave us many issues to think about, um, especially with regards to the subpopulations. But overall, the data showed that OPIL is safe and effective to offer women as an over-the-counter option. And the public comments were very strong in showing the support and the need for this change. Access is an incredibly important issue to women, especially now, and making this change to over-the-counter hormonal contraception will improve access and allow women to use more effective methods. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Pazarek. Paul Pizarek, and I voted yes also. Um, I'm not as eloquent as the other speakers on this panel, but I feel the benefits of having a more reliable oral contraceptive outweigh any risks that might be involved in it. I am concerned a little bit about the subpopulations, those with limited literacy and adolescence. I'm not quite sure. I'm sure it won't be as effective for them, but it'll still be more effective than what's out there available right now. Thank you. Um, Maria Coyle, I also voted yes in support of the Rx to OTC switch for OPIL, uh, primarily because um, I think in the in the balance between benefit and risk, uh, we 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 have a hard time justifying not taking this action. The benefits are are large. Um, the the drug is incredibly effective. Um, I think it will be effective in the 
over the counter realm, just, just as it is in the prescription realm, particularly given um, that, that there may be minimal education occurring currently, um, even for prescription users of, of some of this, some of these um, medications, and that those populations of greatest concern, those with a history of breast cancer or active breast cancer, are already highly engaged in the healthcare system. Uh, I think the, the risk of the medication itself is incredibly low for the vast majority of users, and the risk of unintended pregnancy while real is less than that of existing over-the-counter methods of birth control. Um, like many of the other uh, panelists here today, I was incredibly moved by the, the public hearing comments. Um, and I'm also particularly uh, sensitive to the plight of the FDA having to follow a very stringent process to assure high quality of our, um, of our medication products, but also in the greater context of where is the best, uh, where, where is the greatest good? And so on balance, I felt that the OTC switch uh, served both uh, the public um, as well as my patients uh, in, in my own practice settings the best. So I voted yes. Uh, Dr. Bolan. Hi, thank you. Elise Berlin, Ohio State University Nationwide Children's Hospital. I vote yes on making OPIL available over the counter. Uh, from my perspective as an adolescent medicine pediatrician, I understand that barriers and access to contraceptives are real and very harmful and amplified in adolescence. And these inequities in access perpetuate inequities in communities for neonatal and obstetric um, morbidity and mortality, and also unfairly and unjustly distribute the benefits of contraceptive use. And we should also keep in mind that the health risks of pregnancy, which is the condition that these products aim to prevent, is much greater than the use of any contraceptive product. And this is among the safest um, of the contraceptive products. So given the evidence presented by the FDA and HRA Pharma, the sponsor, I believe that women and pregnancy capable people of all reproductive ages will safely and effectively use the O-pill and the potential benefits outweigh the risks of this product. And I also wanted to emphatically state that I do believe that adolescents will make good decisions about their reproductive health and we can trust teens to make these decisions. And so I do recommend that the FDA make O-pill available to um, reproductive age women of all ages uh, without delay. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Gass. My name is Marjorie Gass, and I can echo the uh, comments of all the other speakers so far. I would just like to thank the FDA for considering this product for over-the-counter use. I think this represents a landmark in our uh, history of women's health. Unwanted pregnancies can really derail a woman's life, and especially an adolescent's life. So I'm very pleased that the FDA is seriously considering this, and I look forward to it being on the market. Dr. Catlin. Uh, yeah, Jesse Catlin, uh, Cal State Sacramento. Uh, I voted yes. Um, the comments from the various clinical experts, I think, clearly indicate that the drug has a favorable safety profile, strong public health benefits. Um, given my background as a marketing professor and consumer behavior researcher, I focused a lot of my attention on the consumer studies. And certainly, while there were some very valid concerns, I believe the limitations of the studies were acknowledged uh, and subject to a very thoughtful analysis by both the sponsor and the FDA. So uh, taken together, um, I, I, with the methodological trade-offs that we know exist in these studies, I think that the results are sufficient uh, to convince me that the benefits of the switch outweigh the risks. Um, I'd also like to say that uh, I'm hopeful that if the FDA uh, approves a swi the switch, that uh, the presence of an OTC oral contraceptive uh, will lead to improved public knowledge about these products and that this should have a compounding uh, positive impact on consumers' ability to use these products uh, safely and effectively that goes well beyond uh, what we even see here today. Thank you. Ms. Rabadi. Hi, Suzanne Rabadi. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, I voted in favor of moving the product 
from Rx to OTC. I support having sponsoring companies meet or exceed the, or exceed the standards set by the FDA. However, that often doesn't happen in these advisory committees because of mitigating circumstances. The comprehension for primary selection, deselection, and purchase decisions, that research has came out pretty well. The areas in which the research seems short have to do with actual use after purchase. I say it seems short because we have no research to which we can compare the data. We have no proof that women receive complete counseling when prescribed or that they are in a situation where they feel comfortable asking questions. We have no way of knowing if they are better or worse in actual use. I believe it was Dr. Glacier who offered two studies that support imperfect compliance in, in uh, pharmaceutically, um, sorry, in prescribed um, oral pills uh, compliance, even with reminders. We also know there are a lot more unintended pregnancies than expected if contraceptives were consistently used appropriately, if oral contraceptives were consistently used appropriately. The comment I could not make earlier due to a tech problem was in response to the FDA comment that the sponsor's access data was not of a quality that they wanted. Even if we had perfect data, without context, is it really useful? How to interpret the data with appropriate targets supported by research was not there. Is anyone here really comfortable with research that has no control group or comparison study? So that was a little bit doomed, I feel, from the start. I believe those that is a mitigating factor and a reason that the uncertain results of the access study should not impede approval. In terms of safety, safety the standards for approving the OPIL would be different today, yes, but that is true for many drugs, including other oral contraceptives. I'm not sure why the FDA brought that issue up in their presentation when that's not a topic for conversation in this group, in this meeting. I found the selecting and deselecting results to be acceptable. Access is the most important issue. I was struck by the sponsor's chart on OTC birth control methods versus prescription options. The methods available OTC are less effective. They need participation by both partners. And frankly, they also need explanation and even practice to use appropriately. The OPIL use instructions are no more difficult to understand and apply than the products available by OTC, and the OPIL is much more effective. Pregnancy is a dangerous physical risk in America and should be a choice, not a trap. POP are more effective than other products offered OTC. More women are likely to be harmed by an unplanned pregnancy and unwanted pregnancy than by the side effects of POP. So once again, I support the transfer to OTC. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Bauer. Cynthia Bauer, I voted yes. Uh, so we heard a lot about the drug itself over the last day and a half. Uh, the FDA team asked us to think about this really as a risk communication challenge though. And as a director of a center focused on health literacy, of course, I was very interested in the comprehension data and the extent to which comprehension transferred into actions. So do I think that we got perfect data? No. Do I think it was a perfect study? No. Do I think it was adequate to feel reassured that um, a large number of people can use this drug uh, as intended? Yes. I would encourage, however, the FDA to continue to raise the bar and continue to uh, ask sponsors to bring in better data about comprehension. Uh, I do want to note that while it is uh, admirable that FDA is focused on limited literacy as one of the po special populations, limited literacy and limited health literacy are not the same. And it would be really important in future studies to make sure that sponsors are very clear on which populations they're including and which measures they're using and what kind of data they're providing. So overall, I do think as a risk communication situation, the benefits outweigh the risks. And that's why I voted yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Hello, Pamela Shaw. And I also voted yes. Um, I think that the benefits outweigh the risk given the overall safety profile of the drug, um, the good levels of self-selection and deselection, particularly for the breast cancer survivors. Um, 
there were, I acknowledge there were some concerns uh, due to um, some vulnerable subgroups, the low literacy, the very young as adolescents um, regarding comprehension and, and whether or not they understood how to use the drug effectively. But I feel like uh, that the concerns related to lack of access and the consequences there outweighed um, the concerns uh, pointed out by some of the low literacy challenges on certain questions. Um, I would like to acknowledge that the, um, the difficult position the FDA was put in by the compromised um, uh, actual use study, um, but I would, and I think if, if the interest of women could be served by getting more data, the FDA feels like they need more data, I hope it could be done in a way that um, was concurrent with approval and didn't um, slow access to this drug. Because I think overall, um, and the public statements really, I think, helped put this in perspective um, in terms of the risks we're weighing here. I think the benefits do um, largely outweigh any risks. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Hahn. Thank you. Um, I, Jolie Hahn, I, Jolie Hahn, vote yes in support of the approval for the over-the-counter use for the O-pill medication and birth control. I believe that the efficacy and safety of this birth control form was established over a half a century ago. And we now have been presented with ample data presenting and demonstrating the effective safe use and benefit of this medication for the people who want to have access to reproductive autonomy. I do appreciate the scrutiny of the FDA board. And I understand that all studies can be improved upon and knowledge base can always be advanced through further investigation. However, based on what we have available to us at this time, the benefit of OPIL being available to diverse populations, including adolescents and those with limited literacy is in demand. And we do have the data that reflects the ability to make this medication and birth control pill available over the counter. We can take this opportunity to increase access, reduce disparities, and most importantly, increase the reproductive autonomy of the women of our nation. I vote yes. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And Dr. Walker Harding. Hi, thank you. Um, I voted yes. And um, some of the reasoning is I, I do think even though that this, this study had limitations, I'd be hard pressed to find a study uh, that won't have limitations considering um, how it needs to be conducted for uh, to get some semblance of uh, resemblance of real world use. Um, I found that what we did find, even with the limitations, was very reassuring that this safe and effective medication uh, can be used by all ages, in particular adolescents and those in uh, limited literacy. Um, and with uh, the knowledge that adolescents, even young adolescents, make the same decisions that adults make with the uh, with medical information given to them, I see no reason to single them out uh, to um, not have it available, even for the youngest adolescents, especially given adolescents have the lowest risk profile. Uh, and again, given breast cancer is the only contraindication to taking this medication. And that is exceptionally rare in the adolescent age group. Um, and uh, also there's no evidence that the risk of using uh, the medication properly is better managed with having a medical professional there. There's no evidence of that. And what we do see uh, really affirms that uh, the use is very similar to what uh, we know has happened in the past with uh, prescription medication real use um, with uh, over-the-counter, I mean, um, oral contraceptive prescription use. So there, I see no reason uh, to withhold this for even the youngest adolescents who can uh, assess when they need that and use it um, appropriately. And if they don't use it appropriately, the uh, safety profile is such that there is very little to uh, no risk with that. Um, I also think it's very telling that public speaking providers and those here on the voting panel who care for adolescents and other women who have these um, uh, need for uh, contraceptives 
do not want to be a barrier to this, do not want to have to uh, be the ones that are withholding a needed medication for women um, and uh, unable, you know, there's low access and knowing that you are the barrier to a young person being able to make a decision about their body uh, is um, uh, very upsetting. I really hope that we can get this uh, approved and over the counter as soon as possible so that more people aren't harmed by the lack of ability to make a decision on what they want to do with their body. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists. Uh, and just to summarize, we have a unanimous vote of our 17 voting members uh, today uh, to recommend uh, the applicant uh, proposal to switch OPIL from RX to OTC status. Uh, before we adjourn, are there any last comments from FDA? Emma Horn, DNPD2 director. I just want to thank the panel so much for all of your careful consideration of the data and for taking the time to explain your votes carefully to us. Um, we paid very careful attention and, and we appreciate the time you spent um, reviewing this application and giving you, giving us the expert advice that we wanted from the meeting. So thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Horn. And I would just echo the, the time and attention each of the panelists has given over the last few days, even tolerating some of our overruns on the agenda to make sure that everyone was heard, including all of uh, the, the members of the public who were advocating so strongly on their own behalf and others' behalf yesterday. I also want to thank the sponsor and the FDA for putting such preparation and, and thoughtful care into preparing the materials for us to consider, as it certainly is a lot of data, and those multiple viewpoints were much appreciated as we considered um, both uh, the FDA's questions, but also the overall context of, of, um, uh, of this switch to OTC um, that we were weighing in on. Um, so given that, uh, I will thank you all one final time and now adjourn the meeting. Take care.